Hey, good afternoon, everybody. We've got a special Saturday afternoon show for you. Well, I guess it could be morning if you're on the West Coast. It's morning for Dan still. Uh, it could be evening if you're in Europe. But uh, hey, we've got a. It's going to be a fun show. We've done one of these with Dan before. We, uh, you know, it was, it was a great interview, great art sale, and uh, I think we've got pretty much a, a similar show lined up for you today. And I saw some questions in the chat already about how the format works. Alberto is spot on when he said uh, that I will explain. Uh, you know how we're going to handle the uh, the sale today when we get to the sale portion of the show. And I, I can let you know we're probably only going to we, we've got 44 pieces to to go over today. So we're not going to be spending an hour in an interview and then trying to sell these. We're probably going to go 20, uh, 25 minutes, who knows, and then go right into the sale. And, uh, you know, there's so much to talk about when we get to looking at the artwork that uh, it won't be boring. I can assure you there's there's so many things to talk about. But, uh, you know, we've got some special rules for the show today as well. Uh, some different things, but we'll cover all of that when we get to that segment of uh, the show today. So Dan is uh, in the green room ready to rock and roll. So let's bring him into the show. Hey, Dan. Hey, how's it going, guys? Hey, good morning. It's good, to, it's good to have you on the show again. Uh, you know, it's 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 always a pleasure. And and the thing is, last time you were in a hotel room. Today you are in your studio. I mean, I I, I want to go full screen on you just so people can uh, bask in the glory that is your workspace. Man, look at that. There's a bit of. I'm going to show you a little bit. I'll show you. Let me move my because I got my phone. I can do this. Uh, so you can see behind me some shelves and. Usually my patrons are the only ones that really see this stuff. So you can see uh, that's kind of a boring shot here. Here's like more of a panoramic view. It's a really packed space. Um, and then there's a hallway that has more bookshelves and toys and stuff. But uh, anyway, um, I've had different studios. Oh, uh oh, damn it. I did It'll come back. We, we had this happen when you were giving me the tour. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there I we just, go. I myself. Um, so I've had several studios, obviously in my life. The first one was the living room of a two bedroom apartment. And I remember when, uh, I, li I lived with my brother and I was going to art school and he was, uh, going to school and working. And I remember I had this, uh, trail of, I had this stack of books, uh, art books, comics, you know, whatever that it was, it was next to my, my drawing table in this corner of the, the living room. And then over the months, this this stack of books moved out like a snake into the living room <laughs> until my brother was practically tripping on it. And he goes, what is this? And I go, I'm sorry, I don't know what else to do with it, you know? Um, and over the years I've had pretty large, I've had large studios. I've had studios that have actually been my bedroom. Um, so uh, somehow I managed to make it all work depending, you know, regardless of the size. So, but this is a, this is a, a cozy space for me. Did I see a bat hanging from the ceiling? Is it your yeah, point? there's a bat hanging from the ceiling. Where'd he go? Where is he? Oh, that's behind me. Sorry. Hold on. Can you see? Oh, uh, there. Yep. Now I see him. <laughs> my John Basema and my Ultraman. And hey, there's a window there that's never opened and has <laughs> never passed sunlight through it. Uh, not, not intentionally. Um, that's another thing too, is, you know, uh, for at least half of my time doing comics professionally, I've been kind of a night owl working at night and, uh, actually I've been on a, a day schedule, uh, for a good while now, you know, maybe, a, maybe a few years, maybe it's because of pandemic. I'm not really sure, but, but, uh, nighttime is great because it's, there's no distractions. Um, it's quiet. The sun isn't shining. Everyone's asleep. It's. I mean, I was just talking with uh, Brett Blevins about this yesterday, about how great it is for a freelancer to be able to work uh, at night and just really, really focus for many hours on what on your deadlines. Mm -hmm. um, and I have fewer deadlines for myself these days, especially this year, since we started doing, um, I, you know, I did the art shows with you and I did some big conventions where I did a lot of pre-show commissions like Como and uh, uh, Trificon, et cetera. And uh, so I, I gave the Kickstarters a break. I haven't done a ton of freelance work. I've turned down quite a bit of freelance work, actually. And just really enjoying um, kind of doing pieces that you guys like and that I like and characters that I like to do. It's just been very freeing. And, and um, I don't know that I'll ever retire. But um, this is if this is retirement where you kind of have less stress, fewer deadlines, and you're doing what you really like to do, I, I can't complain about that. 
Uh, no, uh, that's that's the uh, lifestyle I hope to attain one day, Dan. <laughs> yeah, I think we all do. You know, I yeah. mean, if, if golfing is your thing, and you want to go out to the sunset, um, uh, out on the green. I mean, I, I, God bless you. I mean, you know, for me, this is this is what I love to do. You know, I mean, I love traveling. I love going to conventions and meeting people, and I don't like flying, um, but I like being there. And I like meeting people and talking. And that's one of my favorite things about conventions is uh, it's it, it's talk, meeting people and talking to people, whether it's um, people who like your work, uh, people who read what you write or your peers, you know. So it's um, especially for someone. And I'm sure a lot of you guys uh, relate to this. A lot of you folks relate to this is as a child being into comic books. I was kind of um, I was kind of pretty much alone in that. I think there was one kid that got me into comics in, in elementary school who who liked him as much, if not more than me, and um, which no one liked him more than me. Uh, <laughs> I was obsessed. <laughs> but um, I, it's kind of a lonely pursuit sometimes. You don't have a lot of people that you can kind of share ideas and talk about comic books with. And, and um, it's, it's gotten so much better now that we've kind of, we kind of found each other as adults and, and the, uh, the internet and social media kind of connect us. It's, uh, it feels great. I love it. Right now, you uh, you did go to Como, and you were just at Terrificon. Um, you know, what were some of the more memorable experiences at both of those shows for you? Um, Como is like nothing. You you can tell people, oh, it's gonna be, it's great. You know, like even when we told these, uh, my son and I, my seventeen year old son went with me, and we were telling each other for, I don't know how long, over a year, how great it was gonna be. But you, and you see pictures, but you don't really know till you're there. And I think you can say that about most places that are like uh, unique. Uh, spots uh but there's nothing like it there's no place like it anywhere and one of the things i loved about i mean the show itself was was amazing the the this 19th century uh villa on the lake uh it's just opulent and they use that for the friday night reception dinner which um is amazing uh all the artists gathered i mean a hundred artists gathered with only a few hundred collectors probably less than that because they don't all buy a ticket for friday night and then the show itself is on the same grounds, but it's a little further out uh, in this really state of the art. Uh, it's not a, so much a convention center. It's just kind of an event center. And it's that place is like nothing you've ever been in as far as a comic convention. Because you walk in and there's all these hallways, like a grid of hall. Well, it's probably maybe two or three halls. And then just these these rooms. And um, you go and it's very quiet. There's no Funko Pops. There's no cosplayers. There's... Really, There's no, no uh, over, someone with an overbearing voice telling you to not run in the hall. Exactly. <laughs> None of those super <laughs> annoying, uh, welcome to Comic Con, uh, one more announcement in the next five minutes, you know, that kind of thing where it's just constant. You can't even have a conversation. It's like a freight train going through the room. None of that it was like a, it was like being, it was kind of remind me of being art school or in a library or a collegiate kind of atmosphere because everyone's polite, everyone's conversing, uh, the artists are working um, when they're not talking. Uh, it's, it, I recommend it to anyone. It's an, um, it's an amazing trip and you bring your family and your family has plenty to do if they don't want to go into the show. I mean, they can hop on a ferry and, and just the ferries will take you around the lake and there's all these little towns and villages that you can explore. And then you hop back on, and you come back to Chernobyl, which is, uh, the town where, where, um, Villa Urba is where the show takes place. And people are very polite and most Italians speak English. The ones that you're going to, you know, interact with most of the time, um, it's the food. Obviously, the food is a whole other topic of conversation. So, I mean, I, I, I can't recommend it enough. Um, switching to Terrificon. Terrificon is a great show. Um, Mitch Halleck, who puts it together, is, a, is, is an amazing guy. Um, and he he's a comic book person, too. So he fills the room with, with great guests. Um, and the venue, which is in the middle of the woods of Connecticut by the, is it the Thames River? Is, did they say the Thames or the, it's a, it's a river that runs Thames through. Thames. Yeah. I don't think, I don't know if this, they pronounce it the same as the Thames. In, uh, right. England. Anyway, um, it's a Mohegan Sun Resort. It's like the Logan's Run City. It's just like this big, uh, I mean, it's not a dome, but I mean, you can get lost in there for three days without seeing sunlight, which basically you do. Huge convention center huge resort there's like at least 40 places to to eat uh except it seems like johnny rockets is the only place that's open 24 hours which is eh. uh beautiful uh hotels i mean that place is so much fun 
that place is just a Shangri-La for uh, for comic book people too. So I I can't recommend either of those shows enough. And uh, as far as uh, meeting peers at both shows, what was your most memorable uh, artist creator that you met at Como and then over at Terrificon? Um, in the time that we had to kind of walk around and socialize during those two days of the show, which wasn't a lot because you know you're you're doing a lot of drawing and painting at your at your table, I was able to hook up with a few people I know. Uh, had to see in a while at Cully Hamner and Brian Stelfridge, and I got to meet uh, Mirka Andolfo, who's really great. Uh, and uh, we talked about uh, collaborating on a piece for the auction sometime, like maybe next year or something. I'm not sure I'll, if I'll be there next year, but um, and uh, it, two two nights of dinner, uh, w there were a small group of us, and uh, and the person that I bonded with at dinner both those nights was Simon Bisley. And Simon and I have met a few times in the past, but um, didn't really connect. Don't know, not exactly sure why, but didn't really connect. But then one night, we were sitting in this restaurant, and it was one of those restaurants where there's no English on the menu. I mean, that's not always the case in Italian restaurants over there. And uh, I ordered some <laughs> polenta dish that when it showed up, it had um, like these two uh, sun-dried uh, lake fish on it with the heads on it and everything, which, which I was surprised to see. I wasn't like mortified i was just surprised because i didn't know what was going to come with that and um i was like well i told my son i told everybody at home i said i'm gonna eat whatever they put in front of me and um <laughs> so then i ordered risotto which came in this giant bowl it was like a lake of risotto and i said um to our friend who is sicilian i said am i meant to share this or eat the whole thing he goes no go ahead i go wait so if you ordered this you would eat this whole thing he goes yeah so i'm eating risotto and i guess a piece of rice flipped past me or on my shoulder and Simon was like, um, hey, man, you're spraying the wall behind you. And um, we were kind of a little standoffish until he said, OK, what are you drinking? And then I, I, I said, oh, I'll have a beer or whatever you're having. And then every, the ice was completely broken. And we were we were totally goofing around. He's talking about uh, playing metal bass with my son. He and I are talking about you know, artists. And he's snuffling uh, rice off my shoulder, which I start laughing. And, and he's just making me laugh so hard that uh, I, I, I'm, I start realizing that I'm that the laughing is um, not normal laughing. <laughs> and I it like hit me that I had been carrying around all this stress and anxiety about the show, mostly about travel um, and some other issues about it. You know, just like what do I bring this? You know, just when you're going to make a big trip like that, sometimes you get you, know, you get wound up. And I've been carrying this around for months and Simon broke it through. He broke through it and 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 made it go away, and that's that was that that laughing. And I realized that, and I told him, I said, "Man, I've been carrying this stuff around, and you just broke the dam for me. So thank you." And he kind of patted me on the back. And the next night he was at dinner again. Um, it wasn't necessarily planned, and he is sitting across from my son, drawing caricatures of my son on the uh, the disposable tablecloth, and my son is drawing caricatures of Simon. And I was talking with you know, some other folks at the table who were, you know, the, some other adults at the table for like 15 minutes. And I turned back and these guys are doing dueling uh, caricatures of each other. And they were amazing. <laughs> and, uh, and then I see that he's drawn, he's drawn my son. He's drawn a couple other people at the table. He's drawn um, like his, his art rep, Filippo and his new bride. And he's drawn everyone very unflatteringly, including me. And I said, Hey, this, this, what's that, man? I'm going to draw you now. He goes, Oh, please do. So I drew this big giant grinning uh, ogre, version of Simon and he loved it um, and I got a video of it and stuff and then as as I was taking the video of everything uh, off camera you can hear a bunch of people laughing and it's some people that have walked by the patio uh, of the um, uh, you know because we're outside in the patio kind of closed patio where we're eating and some people on the street walk by and they look in and they see my drawing of Simon and they start laughing really I mean just all this burst of laughter and I look up and it's uh, Kevin Eastman and his his uh, his friends <laughs> have noticed the drawing assignment it was hilarious so i have that I actually have that on video i should post it sometime um so simon later told me that that was the best time he ever had a como um he said you know he had a great time with uh with my son and i and yeah I, you know and i told people i said well if you ever get tired of the um the beauty if you get tired of talking about the beauty of italy and lake como and all the sites you can always just have dinner with simon and forget all that for like an mm -hmm. hour and that's kind of what it was but that was pretty fun. And then um, uh, had uh, dinner with uh, Walt and Wheezy and Arthur Adams at Terrificon uh, one night. 
And that was just great because I hadn't really sat down with Walt Weezy in like years, um, so long. And that was such a treat. Uh, it was one of my kind of goals of the convention was to spend some time with them. And, and uh, that was really great. And Arthur and I kind of were both Northern Californians and he's just, he's hilarious. Arthur is just a very dry, uh, witty guy. I mean, it's really great to be able to um, spend any time in the talking to people and getting to know people who, uh, who are so brilliant. Do you know what I mean? It's just, it's, it's, a, it's a real treasure to treat. Well, that's great. Uh, I mean, I remember seeing the photo with the three of you at Terrificon. And uh, I mean, that's got to be fun. Those, those are yeah. that, that's got to be part of the you know, if you're going to a show, it's it, it's a big, uh, you know, the focus is on the fans, of course, but getting to hang out with some of your peers and people you don't get to hang out with too often. has got to be. Yeah. Uh, well, we're also isolated. I'll tell you, Eastman would be a good person to do a caricature of as well, I think. I, oh, if you, okay. if you ever well, sit down to dinner with him. <laughs> oh, well, I, I just sit back and watch Simon do it because Simon, Simon, after I, by the way, after I drew Simon, Simon showed his appreciation for my drawing by drawing uh, naked breasts on me. Um, so that that meant a lot to me. It showed that I had really uh, affected him. <laughs> but yeah, that would be that would be fun to see. And he and the thing about Simon is when he's sitting and drawing these these this grotesque drawings of people, he has this look of childlike glee on his face. He sits up straight when he draws. He doesn't hunch over. He sits up straight like this. And he's just got this mad scientist uh, grin on his face while he's doing it. Uh, it, I mean, like like a Mad Magazine artist, you know, or something <laughs> um, like what you would imagine a Mad Magazine artist to be like when he's drawing this crazy stuff. It was just, uh, yeah, it was it was just too much fun. Um, I think everybody in the chat is trying to picture you with breasts right now, though. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, we have them sort of, but uh, no, these were these were definitely not what I'm carrying around. For no, sure. I'm sure um, whatever. Uh, I, would... <laughs> I have pictures that I have not posted online um, and. Sometimes you have these uh, these experiences, and a lot of people like to just go right to Facebook or whatever and, and post them. And I understand that you know you get excited, you want people to share with you. But I sometimes I feel like some stuff I want to hang back, you know. Mm -hmm. Simon was like, "You should post that video and explain the whole context of it." And I was like, "I can do that, but I mean, I don't know, maybe maybe down the road I will, you know what I mean? When there's some time has passed, <laughs> I don't care about people seeing a drawing of me. It's it's hilarious, but uh, anyway." Um, yeah. Oh, another thing I might mention about Arthur is uh, Arthur introduced me to sushi. And I really got into sushi uh, after having uh, dinner with him uh, years ago. This is years ago before he met Joyce. And that's what got me into sushi. And I introduced Arthur to his wife, Joyce. So a little tidbit wow. of there. You are, you're a matchmaker, too. <laughs> <laughs> Oh boy! Well, everybody is giving you know giving me a hard time. Not everyone was trying to picture oh. you with breasts in the chat, so oh, I, oh. I get it. Okay. I get well, it. If you were, it's totally fine um, because I put that in your head. It's not your fault. <laughs> and I, I think we have we do have some Europeans in the audience. I think Paul uh, Paulo mentioned good evening. Have have fun. So that's good. Uh, welcome to the show, Paulo. So that's why we do these on, a, on Saturday in the afternoon sometimes, right? It's fun because it does give Europeans the opportunity to tune into these things as well. Yeah, for sure. It's nice to see everybody uh, could make it and um, it makes me happy. Yeah. That. Yeah. Well, I, one of the things I wanted to make sure everybody knew was that uh, we can finally say that you will be coming to OAX next January or this yes. coming January. And uh, I, I'm excited for that. I think we're going to have a, it's, it's in Orlando. It's going to be a lot of fun for those people who don't know anything about OAX. And that, you know, there's probably some of your fans, Dan, that don't, uh, you know, subscribe to all the newsletters and things that we do around here. But uh, I have to get Dan's name on this list. But uh, we've got a art centric show, uh, comic art, illustration, sequential arts, uh, you name it, it's going to be featured here. We've got uh, already more than 20. Uh, sellers that are going to be exhibiting that aren't on this list. Uh, you know, many art dealers, uh, art reps, and auction houses are, are already going to be in attendance. Uh, the guests that we've announced, as at least when I made the slide, which you can see Sean Gordon Murphy, Mike and Laura Allred, Adam Kubert, Bob Layton, Adam Hughes, Kevin Nolan, Palmiati, Gerhard, George Pratt, Garcia Lopez. Uh, you know, there's a, it's a long list of people. Dan Jurgens, Dan's going to be on the show with me on Tuesday uh, for a, just a straight interview. So it's going to be, uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. And just the other day, we even announced uh, Bill Morrison, Matt Wagner, and uh, Jonathan Wayshack. So now we can announce you too, Dan. 
Thank you. That's amazing. What a what a great lineup so far. I mean, I I can't wait to try and make time uh, to to visit with uh, with a lot of those folks. Um, Kevin, uh, I've seen I've been at a couple of shows with Kevin and never really I've only gotten a chance to sit down at dinner and talk with him like I think maybe once. And uh, Jose Garcia Lopez, I met in Terrificon in 2019. He's such a sweet guy. And man, I I can't wait for that show. Thank you for for inviting me. No, it's going to be a lot of fun. And we you know we're trying to take everything that we've been doing on the, the, these live streams for the last three plus years and cat for the last 20 plus and just make, you know, roll that all into a show that, you know, we as uh, fans and collectors, uh, you know, want to, want to enjoy. So it's, you know, ticket sales have been great. I mean, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be fun. I mean, we've got six more months to plan. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of things to still iron out, but yeah, I'm excited about it. I think it's it's going to be something unlike anything that I've gotten to experience before. And, you know, and, and you know, we have, uh, what are there? There's three art cons in the U.S. today, but they're more for vintage artwork. You know, Bashara has a couple shows in California, and mm -hmm. we've got Comic Art Con in New Jersey, but those are mostly dealer shows. They don't bring in too many artists to, uh, yeah. to you know, who are going to be exhibiting, uh, sketching, those sorts of things. So, uh, yeah, everybody's got a lot of different names for my show. I know. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, well, I see somebody's calling it Terrific Cox, and somebody else called it Mega Cox. So yeah, all right, oh, guys. Okay. <laughs> okay. There will probably be a <laughs> never goes away. <laughs> no, exactly, exactly. But uh, but it's going to be a good time, and uh, you know we have uh, we probably got about another twenty or so artists to announce too. We're going to keep it around that like fifty, maybe sixty yeah. number. But yes. we're trying yeah. to balance it out with the number of ticket sales we've got. So um, you know, it's it, that way we can guarantee everybody has a great time. Artists sell, but uh, we wanted to you know it's kind of like we're curating the show too because it's we're getting a lot of people that want to go as an exhibit and we just don't have uh, the room. You know, we're trying to take it slow, right. make sure we, uh, you know, like I say, everybody's got to be a winner when the show's over. Everybody's got to come home with artwork, cash, great experiences, all of that. So, uh, so yeah, didn't, did you mention that you might be bringing a family member with you or uh, are you going to be going solo? Oh, do you think? I don't know. I mean, um, my, uh, my eldest son, uh, has come with me on several trips. Uh, he's 17, my son, Evan. Um, he's grown up in comic book conventions. I mean, since he was in a crib, you know, I mean, when we had him in a crib behind the table at San Diego one year. Um, but to be honest, um, when I do some of these shows where there are a lot of my peers and people I admire and friends and stuff, sometimes I kind of want to go into the weeds of that. And I, I'm, a, I'm a little nervous that, not nervous, but like concerned that, that maybe my kids are going to be a little felt feel left out of that. And mm. so it kind of depends. Uh, but uh, if anyone comes with me, it'd probably be um, uh, my son, Evan. Um, having said that, I have traveled to shows with other artists who live in my area. So we fly out in the same airport in the past. And that's fun, too. Um, uh, so, I mean, you know, I don't know. We'll, maybe we'll have to talk about that. Yeah, no, definitely. We've uh, I, the thoughts crossed my mind because you know, some artists are driving, and you think, well, if you've got three or four people driving from Atlanta, maybe we should yeah. try to figure out how to uh, to carpool for those people, you know, and and try to make this as easy as possible for people to uh, to get to the show. So, yeah, there's a. It's funny when you don't think about those things when you're just spitballing what you want to do, and then you start thinking of how can you make this more and more and more convenient. Not only for the you know the artists in attendance, but even the guests. I mean, sharing on a hotel room. You know, if if yeah. if Jill didn't know that you know her best friend was going, they might both reserve separate rooms, right? But maybe they don't yeah. mind rooming together. So yeah. it, it's a lot to kind of you know. I don't think we're going to get it all perfect this first year, but but I want to try to make uh, you know those things easier for people when they when it comes to planning, you know, especially traveling. This is a show I think we'll have a a good base. For, from the Orlando area attending, but I do think a lot of uh, collectors, you know, and artists, of course, are going to be traveling here. And, and you know, in any way that we can make it easier for them is is something I don't think that a lot of you know other shows have time to do. But I think you know, being nimble and lean and small, I think we can we can kind of come up with ways to make uh, make this work uh, better for everybody. So yeah, Bill, uh, I have a question. Um, so. What what's the situation with art dealers? Uh, are you going to have art dealers at the show? There are going to be some art dealers. Yep. Okay. There were there were some at Como, and there were I heard a few people say, and I think maybe I'm one of them, uh, that maybe there were just a few too many, because they come in with this great swath of uh, of a collection to, mm -hmm. to entice the collectors who are really there 
for the artists. Right. And so it kind of can take away from, um, and so I think there was some talk about limiting, I don't know if the show is doing this, but limiting, it would have been good to limit the, the number of uh, art dealers that come to the show uh, next year. And I don't know if that's going to happen or not, but um, I always feel like uh, anything you can do to, um, to, to put the collectors in the room with the artists, mm -hmm. so they can work it out is good. And I think most collectors prefer to deal directly with the artist. Um, which is why you end up getting so many commissions. I mean, I showed up, to, I did a lot of pre-show commissions for Como, um, uh, <laughs> a lot. And um, when I did, I did a bunch of spec pieces for Como too. And the pre-show stuff outsold the stuff I brought to the show. And I think part of that is, yeah, people want specific characters, but also people want to feel like they, you know, they generated it. They came to you and said, I'd like you to do this for me and you do it for them. And it feels special. And I totally understand that, you know, mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah. can't argue with you at all. Now for Ooh. this show, I want to say yeah. real quick, um, for this show, what I do, and I've done, I did last time in this one is because I, I'm, they're not commissions. I am doing uh, characters that I love, sometimes characters I've not done before that I wanted to do um, for a long time. No one's commissioned them. And uh, characters that I know we love. You know, not just that you love, but we love. I'm not going to, like, I thought about putting Venom on the list for this time, and I didn't because I don't love Venom. I, I don't draw Venom, like, for fun. I didn't grow up reading Venom. I mean, I was, you know, in art school and Venom came out or whatever. or Whatever. Um, so I don't have that connection to some of the characters that you guys love, uh, like Deadpool, for, for instance. Nothing against them. I just don't have the connection. When I have the connection, you have a connection then, you know, that makes it more fun. So when I do something and I, I roll out the Kill Raven, say, from the Bronze Age, and you guys, and some of you guys get really excited about it, that makes me happy, you know? Mm -hmm. um, having said that, I'm not trying to do a bunch of obscure characters. Uh, but um, it's been really fun to just kind of cut loose and have that choice. You know, as a freelancer, you don't always have choices, you know? Um, if You, you know, if you want to work, you want to pay the bills. So this has been great. Right. I mean, you mentioned to me when we were on the phone yesterday about uh, you, you did a Spider-Man. And I was mm -hmm. like, I can't imagine what a Dan Burton Spider-Man looks like. <laughs> I want, you know, it's like, but, uh, so if we do another one of these, I, I want to see a Dan Burton Spider-Man. Okay. <laughs> Even we do another, the I'll do a Spider-Man. Um, the Spider-Man I did was um, something that just kind of popped into my head uh, because um, I can't remember what it was. but uh, And then I did the piece. And then I wasn't sure what I wanted to do with it. And I wasn't sure I wanted to put it to the show. So what I did do is I, I told my patrons on Patreon, I said, I'm going to do an after chat after this, an hour after this is over. And then I'll show you some artwork. Because there was one piece I forgot to put in to send you that's mm -hmm. still here. And I said, if you want to see that piece and a couple other things that you haven't seen before, you'll see them during our chat. I wasn't to entice them to come on. I mean, we're going to talk about other things, but I might even do a little... Uh, a little painting and drawing while well, we're doing... joining you for that chat too. Oh yeah. I hope so. I hope so. So I have this uh, Medusa drawing that I started kind of loosely inking. It's, it's not tight enough that I would have put it into the art show. But it's more of a demo kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I have time to do something while we're talking. Uh, but uh, I will do a Spider-Man next time. I will do a Spider-Man. That's awesome. Time. I, I, I want to see it. I can't, I just can't even imagine, man. I, the uh, drawing man is he's so symmetrical Yeah. that, uh, and I don't really, that's not how I, my brain works i have to really struggle to draw him um so what i'm trying to do is and i also don't i mean i did once uh, ultimate spider-man team up story there was like seven pages of uh spider-man blade and some vampires or something and that was for the last issue of ultimate team up the big the big 64 page or whatever special they did that mm -hmm. kind of uh give the book a send-off when brian decided he didn't want to do it anymore um so i had i had actually planned with brian to do a three issue uh story with spider-man and all these kind of monster characters like morbius and blade and um you know uh maybe man thing or something like that just all these sort of marvel monsters uh, mm -hmm. in the mix three issue arc and then when the the book was uh canceled and they decided to do this last big send-off my three months work <laughs> was shrunk down to seven pages and um so i did pencil and ink it if anyone's ever seen it uh but um that that came out okay, you know, but I have to draw him a few times. I got to sit down and, and, and kind of orient myself to how, how to draw him. And I'm still trying to work that out because if it doesn't look like John Romita, 
then I'm not happy. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. I, I, I have to get over that. Well, you set high, not... high standards for yourself. I mean, that's, the, that's a good <laughs> well, thing though. That's the John, but John, the John Romita Spider-Man is the Spider-Man that uh, speaks to me, you mm -hmm. know, more than anyone other, other artist, And also it's the one that was out there and prevalent when I, when I sort of first jumped into comics. So when I bought the Marvel treasury edition, number one, at a 7-Eleven in what, 75 or whatever it was, 74, 75. Um, you know, there's that big John Romita cover of right. Spider-Man. Uh, I still have that somewhere, but that's to me the epitome, you know. So I have to, uh, so either, either I have to figure out how to, how to own Spider-Man for myself. In other words, come up with a version that I like for me, or I have to keep trying to be John Romita. And the thing is, I'm not. So it, that's what, that's why it remains somewhat difficult. Because I'm trying to, I'm trying to follow in really big footsteps. Well, I, I understand it, man. Uh, I know you're a big fan of Busema Kirby, you know, and uh, like you, we talked about Frazetta yesterday, and you're you're saying, you know, you know, you're never going to be like Frazetta, but you know, you have to kind of, you, you like looking at his work and emulate emulating certain things about it, just knowing that eventually it's going to become your own style, and uh, you know, because you can't you can't uh, you can't compare yourself or try to be, uh, you know, as a, a similar clone or, you know, or following the style of somebody else. But, uh, you know, you can admire and uh, evolve around that style and make it your own. And I think, I think all good artists, you know, that, that we love today, you know, had come up with a signature style. And obviously you have one that is easily recognizable when anybody sees a piece of art that you've uh, painted. So it's, well, thank you. Yeah. that's, a, that's a, that's a great compliment because when I was in art school, Baron story, who is a, massively well-respected uh illustrator in the illustration field um and a great teacher he called that the fourth level and he actually taught a class called the fourth level and he would say fourth level is when you because he had levels he had the first second third fourth but fourth level was when your work is unmistakably yours and um so if anyone ever tells me i immediately recognize your stuff um i'm happy to hear it although i have to tell you that i have no control over that um there's lots of artists out there who can do other people's styles and kind of, mm. can kind of uh, analyze them, absorb them, and then it becomes part of their style. And I've seen that many times, with especially self-taught artists. Um, but I've, I've, I've never, I think I just draw what, what when I draw it, it looks right to me and it, it, it makes me happy. You know, if the face isn't right or something's not right, I have to go back and fix it. And, and sure. there's still other things I'm working on all the time to, to improve. I, I don't ever think the learning process stops, but as far as my influences, you know, Marvel Comics, Gene Colan, John Buscema, Jack Kirby, obviously, um, and and Gil Kane, because Gil's uh, cover work was ubiquitous in the 70s, couldn't couldn't escape it. Um, and and he, uh, Frank Robbins was a, uh, an artist mm -hmm. that saw him working on Captain America and Invader. That just really, I, I knew that I was looking at someone who was like uh, a, from a different era, but it was so damn wonderful to look at. It's just so amazing. Um, and then in Getting into high school, Frazetta, Wrightson, uh, Bill Stout, um, and yeah, wanting and having this kind of goal in mind to to push myself to be as good as Frazetta, knowing full well that would never happen. I mean, I had no illusions about that, but I figured somewhere along the way in, in, in trying to attain that goal, that aspirational and possible goal, somewhere along the journey, I could become comfortable with, with uh, my skills and, and abilities. And that was that was the goal was to, to 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 reach much further than you ever thought you could ever uh, attain to get someplace comfortable and that you felt like you could be OK. Mm -hmm. And so the real goal was to be to be a professional uh, comic book uh, artist. And I remember Baron going back to Baron again, asked, uh, asked some of us in the class one time where you see yourself in five years. And I did say that I said, you know, I'd like to be uh, working for Marvel. And he said, that's not the most uh, lofty goal, <laughs> unattainable <laughs> lofty goal. And I said, well, for me, it is. For me, it's huge. And um, yeah. and uh, yeah, and so I still, I still, um, it's not like I became like the flavor of the month or anything like that. Uh, and that's that's okay. I mean, I understand that. You know, there's plenty of artists who I whose work I love that um, are not the flavor of the month. That you know, his work that I I'm deeply um, uh, moved by, and 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 that's okay. You know what I mean? It's like um, 
I was on a podcast uh, the other day, or just a couple nights ago, and we were talking about David Fincher and, and Alien 3, his first feature film, and that I, I like it. And then everyone else, uh, other monster sci-fi fans, they were like, they were like, no, we don't like that film. And um, and one of them said that David Fincher, they felt that David Fincher was uh, being kind of elitist when he said that he he makes films for only seven people, and none of and they all kind of didn't like that. They felt that was elitist, and and um, I said, well, no, I think I understand what what he means. This is you have to make yourself happy, you have to do what feels right for you, and maybe only six or seven other people. Um, are going to go along with that, you know, mm -hmm. but in order to make the, do the best that you can, I think you have to, you have to um, challenge yourself and make yourself happy. And even if someone like Jack Kirby would say a lot of times in interviews that he was, his first concern and his goal was to make sales, look how he made sales. He did it like no one else did. You know, he didn't copy what was the flavor of the month. He created new uh, subgenres um, and, you know, so I feel like, you know, that mix of wanting to please yourself and do what feels right to you, but also be in mind, be mindful of, of your, your audience. You, I think you have to be mindful of your audience and respect them, you know? Well, Ryan in the chat says, uh, alien three is great. So there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it took a downturn from the first two, but it was like nothing anyone would have expected. And, and, um, right. yeah. So. I think there's a lot to recommend it. Well, before we uh, go into the sales side of things here, uh, there were a couple of questions I saw, just general like OAX things, and I think convention kind of thoughts in mm -hmm. general, but uh, Comics for Sale mentions that it sucks when dealers get in the room first and take up the commission slots before guest center. I mean, I could tell you, that, you know, because remember, I'm approaching this as a collector too. And really good I, point. The and, I, and, and right. And uh, so I can tell you that there's going to be guidelines. I mean, I'm going to be telling every artist that's going to be setting up. You don't take a, you know, don't, you know, because we're doing pre-con lists, right, Dan, at the end of the day for the, a lot of the artists. So, there, you know, that's our that's the artist's opportunity, to, you know, to kind of get some sales in and, and advance the show, already kind of look at it and say, I've already made some money before I come in the door. But uh, but, you know, I'm going to have that as a guideline. You know, I you know, nobody should be able to get on a commission list beforehand. It should be the mantra. Right. I should have a printout that, you know, is out there to remind every artist of that, that sits on their table, faces out for everybody and reminds them that it's, you know, that it's all about the people coming through the, the door when the hall opens that uh, should have their first shots and go to the artists that they want to first to get on commission lists. And so I can I, all I can say is I can assure you that that's uh, that's the approach. And, you know, similar thing, too. I mean, because it's come up, we've already said, you know, if a if a uh, dealer is coming in. Uh, you know, we're basically giving them one, uh, mm -hmm. one pass, one, uh, you know, entry, you know, they have yeah. to buy more, but we're also stating yeah. this is not for sale for other collectors. You can bring in employees, you know? So like if it's an auction house, it's going to set up. Yeah. They need a couple extra badges. Great. You know, but, uh, but those, those conversations are being had now where we're stating, no, you, you know, you, you're not getting your best friend who's an art collector to be in your dealer booth for, you know, early so that he can walk around and get on commission lists. Because even if right. he did, the artists are going to tell him no, but we don't even want that to happen in the first place. So, right. uh, so just let everybody, you know, know that we're, we're, you know, we're trying to approach it like that because we know all the things that really irk collectors. And, you know, that's always been a, been a huge one exhibitor, uh, you know, collectors with exhibitor badges that fill up an artist's list before they the show even opens, right? Uh, always, always something that frustrated me, and I know it's like the number one frustration for all our collectors out there. So we're going to do everything in our power to to uh, nip that, you know, without it ever even getting started. And um, you know, and so and so, you know, just like you were mentioning, so we, that's why we we're trying to do some pre-con stuff too, so we guarantee that art collectors can spend money with an artist before the show even happens and do it like a month or two before the show, right? So that they, when the show comes around, they have more money to come and spend when they get there versus only coming with a finite amount of money. So it's, you know, I mean, that's our approach to, to everything, but you know, who knows? I mean, and I'm sure it'll evolve over time. We're going to learn a lot with show one, but, uh, but those are the things that we're setting in place already. And we're, I guarantee you, uh, you know, Again, as collectors, we want this thing to work well for everybody. Um, um, I wanted to interject just real quick and say that I, I, I have an inkling of how difficult this has been, and how arduous a task this has been for you to put this thing together. And I just think it's amazing that you're doing it. Um, um, I, 
I have friends who put shows together and it is all encompassing. It takes up so much of your time. The fact that you can still do things like this, and I know you have to kind of, uh, kind of cut down a little bit of uh, this kind of stuff uh, between now and the show. Um, the fact that you can still do some of these chats and everything and still put this show together is amazing. I don't even know how you do it, but um, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad. I'm, I'm, I'm hanging on by a thread some days, Dan, but uh, you know, uh, it's to be applauded I'm, for that. I'm enjoying but... it. You gotta, you gotta take it while it's there, right? I'm, I'm enjoying every uh, moment I get to have, whether it's he, you know here or doing, you know, planning the show or running Comic Art fans. I mean, you only get to do this once, right? So uh, yeah, take advantage of it while you can. I don't think you get enough credit for what you've contributed to um, collector Um, I mean, creating Comic Art fans is already huge in itself. Um, it's changed the whole entire landscape so much. And then to do your your podcasts and your art sales and now to do a show, it's like you're, you know, I mean, it's just amazing to me. And I'm not yeah. trying to kiss your butt. It's just No, no. I mean, it, you know, trust me, we're and I'm looking at different ways to make things easier going forward. So I'm not stretched so thin. You know, there's there's things that we're talking about and, you know, between you know, my wife and I and just things that we can do, maybe bringing some people on to help out. I mean, it's mm -hmm. you, you, you can't kind of keep this pace up. I'm 55, right? I mean, I don't <laughs> want to be working this hard when I'm 65. <laughs> so right, I need to right. kind of come up with something. Yeah. Else. And to um, make it yeah. a little more enjoyable and a little less arduous for yourself, for sure. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Coke, Coke or whatever keeps me going. Yeah. The, I've, I've switched from Coke to Zevia because it has no sugar in it. So it's, uh, it's working for me, but you know, why, why don't we get the, to the sale portion of things? So, uh, you know, I want to go over the parameters yeah. for how we're going to conduct this. I've got a couple slides to show off first. These are common ones. We've seen all of this before that, uh, claims will happen in the chat. And after the show is over, uh, you're going to be emailing me, uh, Bill at ComicArtFans.com, you know, giving me the uh, piece or pieces that uh, you did claim during the show or one at auction because we're going to have some of those uh, to start the show with. And uh, when you do that, I, I definitely appreciate you including your mailing address as well. It just kind of gives me all the data I need, uh, especially when it comes time to invoicing and ha having it before, uh, you know, your address before I have to ship stuff. Um, if we, we expect payment to be made within 48 hours, um, the ser there will be a service fee if you have to use PayPal or a credit card, of course. Uh, it's a 4% US, 5.5% international. There's no fee with uh, Zelle. And I also have Venmo. I should have put that on the slide. Uh, we can we can arrange those uh, types of payments as well for those of you who prefer to use those methods. And, and I prefer it too. I don't like having to add a fee on things. But uh, as everybody knows, that uh, that fee comes off the uh, the uh, the dollar amount that comes in, and uh, we want to try to recapture that. Um, as far as shipping goes, uh, the prices of the art doesn't include shipping. Domestic shipping is thirty. International is sixty five. Obviously, you know. Combine, you know, you win two, three, four pieces tonight. Uh, today, you will uh, not char be charged anymore. The uh, fulfillment is handled by yours truly. We ship everything in Masonite, uh, very, very tight packaging. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I make sure that, you know, I wrap it in some yellow tape as well. So there's no way that uh, the, the postman is going to lose that thing on a, on a shelf in the back of their truck. So it's, uh, you know, that's, that's uh, the way we handle things there. Now for this show, like I mentioned, there is actually, we're going to start off with an, with an auction. We have eight pieces that uh, Dan and I looked at uh, yesterday after I had everything here that we decided we would auction off. They are, you know, they're everything that Dan does is great. You know, and, and I, so I wouldn't even say these are the eight best pieces, but these are the eight pieces that we felt yeah, were, right. We felt these were the eight pieces that were appropriate to auction. Starting uh, bid on these would be at or below what we would have priced them at to start them at. And, you know, we so we have two wrinkles in this show because we want to make sure that everybody has the opportunity to walk away with art today. I and mean, we have 95 people watching the show right now and uh, we have 44 pieces of art. So we already know not everybody who's watching is going to get a piece of art. But uh, that was why we decided to have an auction component be a part of today's show to uh, kick things off. We did that with the Linsner show, as people remember, and, you know, and that went uh, pretty well, I thought. And uh, we're going to do the same thing here. So uh, with regards to the eight auction pieces, uh, we've got, uh, you know, please try to keep your bid increments at least $25. I mean, you know, go a little higher if you're comfortable with that. You know, we want to, we don't want to dwell on the auctions for too long. Uh, you know, please note, you know, Dan and I are five seconds in the future. And it's always good to know this because the thing is, is that in an auction format, you know, I, I'm going to say, all right, I'm going to give you a 10 count. 
by the time I say five here in the studio, that's really when you're, you know, you're hearing 10 or when I say zero, you're at five. So don't try to snipe pieces. If there's a piece you want, place your bid and, uh, you know, on the piece, don't, don't wait until the last second. Cause I guarantee you it will not work when Dan and I in the studio say it's done, we're done. And if a, if a bid comes in afterwards, we're sorry, there'll be another piece for you to, to place a bid on. Um, you know, that's, uh, that's just how it goes, but there's two ways to make sure you're as close to real time as possible. If you're on YouTube in the lower left-hand corner of the uh, screen, just, uh, you know, right down there, there's a, uh, the word live, if you click live, that'll kind of speed you up to where we are at as well, as close as everybody is at. And the other way is just refreshing your browser that, uh, kind of speed, you know, gets you up to that, uh, close to real time as possible. But always remember, we are in the future by a few seconds. And uh, at the end of the day, that's that's the rule. Don't don't snipe. Um, let's see, I'm trying to think of, uh, da, 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 da. okay, during the auction, we will not, uh, we have no limits on the number of pieces. Like if, if one person wants to win all eight of them, that's fine, that's wonderful. Uh, don't foresee that, but that's, that's out there. When we get to the fixed price pieces, that we have 36 of those. And more than half of the lots that we have today are priced below $1,000. you remember the last show, we didn't have, uh, you know, there was about the same number of pieces, but we maybe had 10 pieces under 1,000. We probably have more pieces under 1,000 this time than we had in uh, the first go around. So uh, be, we did that because Dan wanted to ensure that uh, more of the art uh, is, you know, available in varying prices and also that more fans will get a chance to get artwork here today. Um, and you know, that was, uh, and, and you'll see too, Dan, you worked in 11 by 17 formats. And I don't think we did anything that size before. So some of these pieces mm -hmm. that, uh, are more like an ink wash or an ink wash with light color are done on 11 by 17. So we, we kind of mixed up the format of some of the pieces too, for this. Yeah. Uh, I think and, the small uh, pieces, the smallest pieces, uh, nine, maybe nine by 12, nine by uh, 12. Right. There's a couple of them. Yeah. There's, there's a few of those. <laughs> uh, but uh, so so with all that being said, there's there is the rule that we've decided to implement um, as far as getting multiple pieces of the fixed priced lots today, because, again, there are 36. So what uh, Dan and I decided yesterday was that after a buyer has claimed three fixed priced lots, uh, that after that point, you've got to wait at least 20 seconds from the time we show another piece of artwork to claim it. You know, you got to give the other people in attendance the opportunity to uh, to pick up a piece of art as well. Uh, 20 seconds seems you know like a fair amount for, uh, you know, to Dan and I to, uh, to to wait. And, you know, at the end of the day, uh, again, it's all about trying to get more artwork into everyone's hands. And, you know, that's that's what uh, Dan is all about. He does it on his Patreon quite a bit. And we're going to be doing that as well today. Um, trying to make sure I didn't miss any of my notes here. Uh, but once we get to the recap, you know, if any, any of the pieces that don't sell, when we go through everything, you know, we recap it at the end. And when we recap it, there's no, you know, if, if you've got, if you've already bought 10 pieces, you don't have to wait any time. When we recap it, go after it. When we, when we get past lot 36, if we haven't even started the recap and you've already gone over the three piece limit, you're more than welcome to just say, claim this lot, claim that lot, claim we, and we, then we don't even have to go to the recap for those pieces. I'm fine with that too. Um, it's all about, again, trying to get art into as many collectors' hands as possible and yeah. not dragging this out past a two-hour window because we've got an hour and 10 minutes now to get through 44 pieces, which I'm <laughs> confident yeah. we can do it. And I want people to, I want everyone to go away happy. I, I you know, I, um, so. Exactly. And I, and Alberto answered a question. Yes. Uh, you get multiple pieces. Shipping's the same, uh, as I mentioned earlier on the uh, slides there. So, so like I said, we're going to start with the auction pieces first. We have eight pieces here and, uh, they're, they're all fantastic. I mean, and, and I do have to note that the first piece, I didn't realize it. I had listed it as 10 by 14 because, uh, that was what was on your sheet, Dan, but it is actually 11 oh. by 14, which oh. is probably okay. why it makes the piece feel that more imposing. When, oh, okay. uh, when when you look at it um but uh now again so as far as bidding goes you don't have to don't we've got everything numbered one through eight as far as the auction lots are going we're no we're, we're going to be looking at lot one you don't have to say lot one this is the number just put your bid amount in there and uh we know which piece you're bidding on so uh so here we go we can go ahead and show the first lot of the day so this is uh dr doom starts at a thousand dollars uh, as far as the auction goes, I wanted everybody to know it's not 11 by 14, like I said, or it is 11 by 14. It's not 10 by 14. But this piece mm. is awesome, Dan. I mean, we were 
we, we were talking about how you've uh, you, you kind of like putting the uh, you know the critters on the you know and the, the creatures and the characters that you uh, you paint you know, onto something imposing. And I, I just thought like you know the V the V Victor Von Doom the chair the fire I mean the Kirby crackle on all of this stuff. <laughs> I mean uh, this was just awesome. I love this piece from the moment I saw it. Um, I love uh, being able to do Dr. Doom and uh, I get commissioned to do him here and there, but this time I thought I got I got to put him in because it's just too much fun to draw. And, um, it's just, he's such a, he's just the, I think, I don't know. I guess he's Marvel's, you know, probably most um, uh, beloved villain. You know, I mean, I guess arguably, but going back through time, he's just, he's taught. I also love the fact that he was always teaming up, whether it was with Namor or sometimes with the Fantastic Four. Um, that's another thing about, I, I like about um, about Marvel comics and, and, you know, maybe comics in general is that you don't always know the allegiance of a character. Um, you can trust that he's got something up his sleeve, but it's kind of fun to see them work together uh, for a while. And I think when you're a kid, I think there's a lesson to, to, to be learned from that too. Um, I don't know if it's about not trusting people or if it's learning to trust people, but um, he's just a great colorful character. One of these days it'd be fun to do a supervillain team up piece with Namor and, um, and Doom. I think it would be fun to do. Uh, yeah, absolutely. It was funny when we were, you and I were talking about potentially one day doing like two uh, character pieces and I was thinking about doom and i'm like who you know if dan was going to do uh you know a two character piece you know doom would be a great villain to have on that page and i think yeah. god there's so many cool heroes that you could mix it up with and even another villain you could do doom and hella you know versus you know yeah. the doom and the, and the thing would be you know incredible uh this this was this was like my inspiration for this piece was if you can see uh one of the issues uh there's a two it's a two parter maybe I'll, I'll hide myself here for or the art for a second there Oh, so, okay. Yeah, yeah. This was on my desk when I was doing the piece. Um, and I have, you know, both of the issues that, that this, it's like a two, two part arc, but, uh, Basema doing, uh, Doom and, um, Thor. <laughs> I mean, so great. How do you not get inspired by that stuff? You know? Right. No, I'm, I'm with you on that one. Uh, and that was always one of my favorite Thor, uh, storylines that, uh, you know, those two, uh, those two books with, uh, yeah. with Doom. Yeah, uh, so we're, to pick up the hammer. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, so we're at thirteen hundred dollars right now, and uh, the bidding has slowed down a bit. Marie Roach is uh, in uh, in the lead here. So uh, you know, at this point, I'm going to say we're going to you're comfortable with going to our ten count, Dan, on this one. Uh, yeah, I think so. Okay, so we're going to go. Remember, when I hit five, everybody, you know, you're you're out of luck for you. So uh, we're going to go ten, nine, eight. Seven, six, five, four. I should have said Thor. Three, <laughs> two, one. All right. Murray Roach has uh, gotten this one. Congrats, Murray. Congrats, Murray. Thank you. Yeah, that is. Uh, it, it's beautiful, man. I, I, uh, I was in. I was really excited to see this one, and you know, and you do make great villains, uh, you know, because obviously that's kind of, you know, you, you've got the nocturnals, you've kind of got that bent where you can draw monsters and things. And yeah. so just seeing you work on a, on a doom piece uh, was, was cool. So, uh, so I, again, thank you, Murray. So we're going to move right on to the next piece. Now the next piece is going to be a surprise to everybody. I know when I showed uh, pieces on Thursday, I said, you know what, I'm going to get this one. And I tell you, Dan, I'm not going to bid because <laughs> I, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, oh, Dan, Dan and I talked and uh, we, we had this idea for, you know, for talking a bit more about a Thor related commission. Uh, right. right, right. And, mm -hmm. and I was like, you know, that's probably the better way to go now. Uh, but so this next piece is going to be Thor, ironically. And you just showed that cover from Thor. Yeah. More and uh, more inspiration. Exactly. So, uh, so, you know, just everybody bear in mind that uh, that's uh, that, that's where, where, where I'm at with this. I thought I saw this piece and I was like, this one must be mine. But uh, <laughs> but after Dan and I talked, I'm like, you know what? It's better uh, to make it you know available to everybody. Now, this one is 10 by 14, like the next uh, this one and the next six pieces are uh, starting bid on this one is a thousand dollars. I mean, I've it's it's every bit as amazing as it looks right there. I mean, I, the colors pop. I mean, it's funny, you know, because I got it in hand right now looking at the the red in this cape. The, you know, the painting is so much more vibrant 
than any scan could ever, uh, you know, yeah, ever that's, do. That's actually the case. I think a lot, uh, some people are there. I've, I've heard from a lot of people who are really surprised when the piece shows up in their hands and they're, they're like, wow, it looks even better in person. And, and it's, it's the tough thing. Cause I'm not, um, I'm not exactly a Luddite, but I'm not like an, I'm, I'm an expert with uh, scanning and Photoshop stuff. And I, but I do try. And the thing is, is just the, the bare facts of it is there's more colors in what we can do as artists traditionally than exist in um, the ability of, uh, of any scanner to, to, uh, to record. So you're going to see colors in these pieces when they show up on your, your doorstep and you open them up. You're going to see colors you didn't see before. I'm just warning you right now. And it's not an exaggeration at all. No. Yeah. And this one, I mean, it, I'm sure I'm going to notice it in every one of them. But yeah, it's it's crazy how uh, how vibrant this thing is in person. So um, but yeah, Thor, as everybody knows, is my favorite Marvel character. And uh, and. Dan and I were like, well, maybe maybe we should do something that's kind of in homage to uh, Busema, maybe a Kirby, something you know that Dan would kind of just run with after we kind of you know kicked some ideas around. And and I was like, you know, that's that's that, that's cool because that's something personal now between Dan and I, and we you know we've we've known each other for a while, and so I think you know getting a piece like that is all the better. But you did you did have to drop this in here because you did ask me after this last show like what character. Would I like to see uh, done yeah. if I was going to get one? And I told you Thor, and then you had to put one in here. So I'm glad you did, though. It's it's, it's amazing. Fun to be able to, I don't get asked to do Thor very often. I, I mean, I can count on one hand uh, the amount of times in my career uh, that I've been asked to do Thor. Um, but uh, I was trying to give him my best. When I was when I was actually hired by Marvel to do a Thor cover in the early 2000s, I was so excited. You know, a painted Thor cover. Wow. And then it turned out that it was um, a, it was the costume where he has a beard and it's like the metal wings. Yeah. Uh, and I it, that dampened my enthusiasm a, a little bit. But to be honest, when you're a freelance illustrator, you have to throw yourself into it. And to be honest, it was fun. I had a great time. Um, and then later on, they used that uh, that cover image to uh, um, to sell a, a version of the that same costume and everything, that same version of Thor as, as a legend figure. Um, and that's, geez, that might go back like a decade or something. And uh, so that was kind of cool to see if they'd use my art in the corner of the, the card. And actually, um, my son, who's 12, is really deeply into Marvel right now. And um, I told him about that. And he goes, really? I go, yeah. So I found I found a, a, a figure on eBay because I, I guess I don't own it. I don't own it. And I, I got it for him. And he was just like, I go, you you know, you probably shouldn't open that, right? He goes, no way, I'm not going to open this. So, all right, good. <laughs> so we hung uh, in on the wall. Sure. In his room. Well, I did uh, text in the chat 10 seconds ago that we started the uh, countdown because I didn't want to er interrupt you. But okay. uh, we've, we've got Gabe Carino at uh, 1,050. And uh, Gabe, Gabe was one of the, it was uh, one of the two people that got your mystery sketch uh, oh, from... Oh. The yeah. last comic our live, he gave. Yeah, I think he got right. the Doctor Doom, if I'm not mistaken. So, uh, congrats, Gabe, uh, on the on the Thor again. And yeah, I, I can hold this thing up, but it's yeah. still it's so much better uh, in person than in the uh, the scans that we're able to show everybody. Uh, but thank you, uh, thank you, Gabe. We appreciate that. So we're gonna move on to a uh, another piece here. Let me go ahead and show the third auction lot, and uh, this one is Lavidia. And it is on 10 by 14, like the remaining auction pieces are. Starting bid on this one is 1,000. Did we have a Lavidia last time? I don't recall. Uh, I don't know. This is a character that I kind of was drawing. Is kind of carnival goth girl character. And I, someone had asked me not that long ago, a few months ago, so does this character have a name? Because I had done her more than once. And um, I said, Oh, I better come up with a name for her. So I just sat down and started playing around with ideas and stuff. It came up with Lavidia. Um, and so I've done her a few times since then. And and I I I think at some point she's gonna she may end up in, in the nocturnals if I can find a, a place for her that works, because she's this sort of like pale brunette character, and there isn't like a really a version, there isn't something like that in nocturnals, I don't think yet. Uh, there's one vampire character, Lady Goodnight, who's a brunette, but I wanted something a little bit different and um, 
so yeah, I've done a few of her. She wasn't, I don't think she was in the last show, but I, there's actually another, oh, I guess I'm letting a cat out of the bag. There's another Lavidia piece that's in here. Um, it's not a, a color, a watercolor type finished piece like this one. It's, it's ink and wash. Um, and that's where she has like her trademark top hat on. But in this one, I took the top hat and put it in her hand and did the tombstones and stuff. So it's fun to do. Definitely. And well, Halloween's yeah. coming up. So, you know, we're getting into the season soon. So I know um, I was thinking of, you know, the timing wise, it would be great to do a show with you around, uh, around Halloween, but I think so with the way our, yeah, I'm yeah. sure you've probably got it. You're very booked that month. <laughs> well, well, there's a lot of birthdays in the family too. You know, I actually, um, there, I was going to do this show. There was a show in the Isle of Malta. It's like the weekend before Halloween. Because Halloween's on a weekday this year. Mm -hmm. And um, I was going to do the show. And then I just thought, you know, I just think I've done enough international traveling for one year. And I did a, I did um, Baltimore last year, which I believe is right around uh, the Halloween time. And it to was, be honest, yeah. When I when I do how when Halloween comes, I want to be with my family. We, we it's like a big it's like Christmas for us. It's like a, it's as big as I don't know if it's as big as Christmas for them, but it is for me. And I like and I don't <laughs> want to miss uh, my my three year old who will be four uh, this time. My my three year old daughter will be four her fourth her third or fourth year trick or treating. So, and not that I would if I went to Malta, but then again I might. You know I might have some pretty pretty nasty jet lag. So. Uh, but there's a lot of stuff going on in October. I'm doing, I think I'm doing maybe one convention. Then. I'm not sure. I know I'm doing, um, there's a Dallas convention coming up that I think might be in October uh, that Mark Walter puts on. And then there's a show in San Francisco that's right after Thanksgiving that I'm doing, which is a drive for me. It's just like a, you know, it's not that far away. So I'll be right, doing that. In your backyard. Yeah. All right. So, well, we didn't get it. We didn't get a bid on that one, Dan. So oh. I'm going to, I'm going to set that to the side. Okay. And we'll come back to it. Uh, we'll show it in the recap talk uh -huh. about it uh but we're going to move on to the fourth auction piece that we've got today and again it's it's uh, uh you can just can't can't compare the uh the scans i'm going to show with the, with the actual piece but here we go this is uh the clea dr strange piece auction lot four 10 by 14 and uh starting bid on this one is a thousand i think you did you did do a clea in the uh the first show we did right yeah yeah i did uh the sorcerer sort of uh supreme version uh, which people seem to like, and it's kind of fun, you know. Um, I uh, I think the next time I do Klee, though, I'll do the more traditional version, um, the Dick Jean Cohen version next time, because I like doing her. She's fun to do, you know, the purple and the the platinum blonde thing. But there's something really powerful about her as the as the Sorcerer Supreme, and um, I have to thank Wayne uh, Rousseau for kind of pulling me in because he was the first person to commission me to do uh Klee as a sorcerer supreme or dark Klee actually and i wasn't really aware of of, of that story stuff and so it was kind of kind of cool to see that well ec harris has uh started the bidding at a thousand thank you for that ec um alberto's reminding me that i'm falling behind i've got uh, 55 minutes for 36 pieces oh, i'll do it okay. albert alberto we can do it and uh frank robert johnson asked uh uh, is every one of the original signed? Yes, I don't think I saw one piece that wasn't signed in all the. All Actually, the they're the signed on the back too. I've, I've uh, it's sometimes, occasionally, I'll do like a DB, like a shorthand signature, but but I've been taking to writing my full name on the back of the, every piece now, so it should be on the back. I did notice that actually, yeah. not on all of them, but uh, but maybe maybe on the ones where you do the DB. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, we're not seeing any other bids. So I'll, I'll give. I'll say we got the ten seconds uh, right here. You know, we. I'm. I'm not going to count down every time. I. I feel uh, self conscious when I when I do a countdown. But we've got ten seconds here. So if anybody wants to throw a bid in in the next ten seconds, we'll. Uh, we'll gladly accept it. Otherwise, uh, you know, we'll move on to the next piece. But uh, uh, there, I, I. Well, Jason Harris asked. You know, because you're wearing a Silver Surfer T-shirt. I don't think we. Yeah. I know we don't. We don't have a Silver Surfer in here this time around. Uh, uh, is that a character that you've uh, got ever gotten requested? I mean, I assume somebody's had requested one when you're at a show. Um, okay, I think someone I did a I did a Mephisto, and um, and I had the surfer in it. And actually, that piece uh, is on eBay, and it's been on eBay for a really long time. No one's uh, bit yet. And uh, again, it's no, it's one of those things where don't take the the look of the thing by the the horrible scan that's on the on the uh, right. 
you know, on the eBay auction, it's a, it's, a, it's Mephisto and then Silver Surfer kind of sliding in. He's really small. Uh, but no, I've done, um, I've done, I've done here and there. I love the Silver Surfer. He's one of my favorite characters and I hope to do, and I'll do one next time. I'll do a Surfer next time. Cool. Well, EC Harris has got that, uh, the Clea at $1,000. I've Thank teased you, everybody. You know which piece is coming up next. I think a lot of people have seen this. I mean, you, you did a hell of the last time. It was gorgeous. This hell is gorgeous. So uh, we'll go ahead and start auction uh, five. The bidding on this one is going to start at 1100 though. Uh, you know, this is uh, 10 by 14 on watercolor paper signed on the front and the back. I should, I should add uh, this one now that I'm turning them over. And you sign them in, uh, it looks like in, is it paint? You, see, you, you paint your signature on the back as well. Uh, I think it's a brush pen. I think it's a. Uh, oh, is it? Like, what color is it? Is it black or red? It's it's, it's black, but I you know it's uh, modulated, so it definitely looks like uh, paint. So it's, maybe it's a brush pen. Yeah, it's a zebra brush pen. It's the same thing I used to ink most of these pieces with. I use two different pens usually. I use a a zebra brush pen, which is a kind of throwaway pen, and then um, a Pentel uh, brush pen that has a cartridge in it uh pocket brush pen i don't i don't know if you, you can't see it on the screen but sorry I'll hold it up. but i use those and i also have a gray marker a gray brush pen that i think is made by zig i'm not really or maybe not i'm not really sure it's all in japanese but i love it because it does this gray um and uh it's great to do the modeling in the gray with it um and if it starts to get uh like lose ink, I can I can put more ink in there and mix it up and uh, and keep keep it going. I don't have to use the ink they give me, but I do like the ink they give me. It's permanent. It's important that if you're going to use gray ink or any other ink on these pieces, that, that it's permanent ink. And finding gr a gray ink pen, brush pen is not that easy to do. Um, I imagine uh, Ryan Peters went right to twelve hundred dollars on this one. So thank oh, you, Ryan. That's yeah. where we're at right now. Uh, we'll give everybody you know another. 10, 15 seconds, and uh, we'll call it at that. If uh, anybody would like to put a bid in, do it now. Don't try to snipe. There's no timer on the screen to let you know when we're done. Um, you know, we're just uh, playing it all by ear here with this. But uh, we definitely appreciate uh, all the bids and comments in there. I saw after you mentioned that you would do a uh, Silver Surfer later, Jason says that uh, he's going to start saving and watering his money tree. <laughs> That's the, the Surfer is, you know, um, you know, he's... He's a cool character for, for what's kind of fun with him is that when you do him, he's he's kind of monochromatic, but you can play around with the reflected colors in him. If, if he's in like a, a space scene where there's different colored planets and, and nebula and stuff like that, you can kind of play around with that. And that's kind of what I want to do is I want to really go into like the Kirby sort of uh, vibe with that. Um, sure. And uh, yeah, so I, I, that would be a lot, a lot of fun to do. All right, well, we're uh, calling this one for Ryan. Thank you so much, Ryan. We sincerely appreciate it. Congratulations. Now, Thank yeah. you. Now, uh, next, of course, we have uh, you, you did a Medusa last time and you've done another Medusa this time. So that is going to be our sixth piece of the uh, show here. So let me go ahead and show that one up right here. So uh, $1,100 start price on this one for uh, the sixth auction. It's on 10 by 14, like everything else. Uh, and you know, I, I couldn't place the thing that she was sitting on, but you did explain it to me, uh, you know, that it is a Kirby creature of some kind. And do you have yeah. reference to show? Well, I was looking through, I think I might have it here. I was looking through, um, uh, an issue of, uh, amazing adventures. You can see. And, uh, it was cause I'm, you know, I'm always trying to find good reference of Medusa from a certain era, that sort of purple costume. Um, Although I should do the Fantastic Four costume in the 70s at some point, you know, where she had the mask and the gloves and, the, you know, when she decided she was going to join and change her costume. So yeah. there's this in this story that's in uh, Amazing Adventures number three where they uh, they're going down into the, the bowels of this city. They're fighting the Mandarin and they find this idol um, that they have to destroy before it opens its eye and attacks them. And so. I was trying to I was trying to come up with ideas for what she could be sitting on, um, and so I found this thing. Can you see that? Oh yeah. And I was like, that's oh, cool. gosh. Now so, yeah, I get it. I, so I, I I threw it in there. <laughs> so it has that Kirby uh, another another Kirby um, influence that. Uh, how can you, you know, how can you not want to play in that sandbox? I uh, I agree. I mean, she's a beauty. Um, 
Let's see. So, uh, so we don't have a bid yet on this. Eleven hundred dollars is where we want to start it, and uh, definitely worth it. I think when we did the other piece, uh, the the last Medusa was, I think, it was a little bit more than that. I, I can't remember. Maybe I'm wrong, but I remember it was highly desirable. It might have been around my, the same one. I actually think this one is cuter, um, but uh, and I think the the line work and the application is a little more delicate um, than the last one. But I like them both. I really like them. I know, I know you have a preference, Bill. Um, but uh, she's a lot of fun to do, and there's always things you can do with her hair. And so oh yeah, push it as much as you want to. Well, we talked about some ideas yesterday too. Uh, but yeah, no, it's it's a great piece. Is this one? It's the only signed on the front on this one, Dan. Oh okay. Well, well if we're, signed. what's that? I said it's definitely signed. Yes, it is. And I saw uh, with the last piece, Frank Robert Johnson tried getting in a last second snipe. Remember, everybody, when you know, sniping will not work here in the studio. So uh, it's, uh, you know, that's what happened. So he had a 1250 uh, bid that he was trying to put in there, but we had already closed it out. So uh, we don't have a bid on this one yet. So I'm going to set this one aside. Okay. That's uh, the second one I've put over in the, uh, we'll come back to it later. So we got two more pieces here to auction. Next up is this uh, beautiful Catwoman, and I should have should have held it up. Oh, I got the wrong one. Ah, sorry, I've got no. Actually, I, yeah, I've got it in the wrong order. I did want to show that piece. Uh, lot seven. See, I was showing you lot eight. Oh. Now we got it. Yes, it's the Poison Ivy. Is this next one? Now this one starts at a thousand. It's on ten by fourteen. Uh, beautiful color work on this one, Dan. I mean, everything that uh, you'd want out of a Brereton piece, right? Is uh, is in this one. Uh, gorgeous figure and again i just you know i love the the greens the blues the orange i mean and then just the uh uh the craggy uh vines and stuff i mean and skulls of course well there's one skull yeah yeah there's always a little peek at death in there um again this is another piece that uh the original is far and away more impressive than than the scan and uh, it's just because sometimes when you're scanning like like say you do the moon and you do a, a kind of pale watercolor wash over the moon, the scanner will sometimes have trouble reading that uh, that that uh, le that value, uh, the lightest value uh, against the other one. So I have to really try and work with the with Photoshop to try and get it right. Um, but uh, yeah, this I I like doing her with the greenish skin. I'm not sure what people's preference is because of the last poison ivy we did she had kind of more uh, normal flesh tones but i like the greenish skin it kind of sets her aside and i think that was something that was started with uh uh batman adventures but bruce tim and his crew were they had that sort of idea which i, th I think is really effective and kind of sets her apart even more as a, a kind of a, a unique villain so i like doing i like doing both but I sure like for sure Hey, we do have a question from EC in the audience. Uh, EC, of course, got uh, the Clea, the, the Lot 4 auction, and, and he's asking, uh, would he be allowed to switch his Clea for his Ivy? I mean, I guess he can, he's only able to pick one piece today. Um, oh, I, I, don't, I don't see why not. We don't, have a, we don't have a starting bid yet, so I mean, I don't see why not. Okay. Then uh, EC is, you know, at least state that you wanted to start your bid at 1,000 in the chat so we can we can see it confirm it and we're happy to strike the uh, the, the bid you had that won lot four so uh, you know again I, yeah I get it when I'm on a budget too it's like sometimes sure. you have to you know make uh, okay and EC, EC's agreeing you know is agreeing that he wants to do that right there so uh, thank you EC no All right. Problem. Well, I am just, uh, I knew I should have wrote in pen, uh, pencil, not pen on my sheet today, but you know, I, my, uh, <laughs> I should, I, I never do what I think I should do, but all right. So EC, uh, you are the top bidder on this one. If, uh, we'll go ahead and say, uh, you know, 10 seconds, anybody that wants to put a bid in on this as well, uh, please do. And if not forever, hold your peace. And uh, it, cause it, it is a beauty and it's funny again, just looking at it against that, the orange is so vibrant, you know, it, behind her, it's uh, it's funny and it's so, so matte, uh, you know, in the uh, scan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's all these uh, variations when you're using watercolor uh, as opposed to more of a flat uh, finish, like acrylic or gouache that, that watercolor um, uh, is elusive sometimes to a scanner. And so when you get the piece, when you look at the piece and you see the way that the, the pigment sits on the paper, it's really, it's, it's kind of exciting. To see what it does, you know, which is one of the, the 
kind of things about it that I've always liked. All right. Well, EC, you have claimed this one. We appreciate that. I'll put that over in the uh, sold pile. I'm going to move the Clea back over here so I don't forget about that. Uh, we've got uh, one last piece, and I already teased it because I showed it out of order. That is this uh, Catwoman from uh, the the 80s here. Let me get that slide up on the screen. So this one's starting at a uh, $1,000 bid, Catwoman, 1980, uh, again on 10 by 14. Uh, you know, this is, uh, I don't know, I, when I saw this image, I mean, great pose, little, you know, a little bit of action. I, I mean, the, the purple and the green, you know, work so well together, you know, on the costume anyway, but uh, just just a great character for you to do a painted piece on. And I don't, did we have a Catwoman in the first set I, uh, you know, that we did? I, I don't recall. I did one, uh, someone, uh, one of my patrons commissioned one not that long ago and uh, same costume. And I like this costume. You don't see it that much. And she has a cape. You know, I don't know why there's green in her costume, but we that's a conversation we've had in, on the Patreon um, uh, about before. Um, but uh, the, the difference is between that one and this one, because I think they're the same, close to the same size, the same size, is I didn't do the cat in that one. Um, and I thought, you know, I should do it. I should put a cat in here. Um, so yeah, she's just really fun to do, and and the little bell and on her neck and everything like that. And this is when I was reading comics. Uh, I didn't read um, a lot of DC comics in the seventies, but in the eighties, uh, around eighty three or so, eighty four, I was reading a lot of Marvel. And I have to thank Walt Simonson for pulling me back into the Marvel comics with uh, his his uh, run on Thor. And then I started picking up Detective because I saw that uh, Gene Cullen was drawing it or Ross Andrew was also penciling it. And uh, this was the version of Catwoman that I, when I first started reading comics. Uh, and I know it goes back further than the 80s. Um, and Jose Garcia Lopez, I see his renditions all the time. They're just really mm -hmm. fun. But uh, yeah, she's she's a great character. So it's like Bane. We have uh, Wayne at 1200. Wayne at 1200. So uh, we'll go ahead and uh, just say, you know, in uh, yeah. 10, 10 seconds, we will call this one. And, uh, you know, Wayne is at uh, the top of $1,200. So yeah, it is a great piece. Uh, as I think, as our every, every piece we've got here. So um, you know, that's what's been fun, Dan. I, you know, I, I like getting to handle the art now. You know, I didn't get to do that <laughs> a year ago. But, oh, okay. uh, that's yeah. been the best part of me doing these sales shows nowadays when I work with an artist is I get to I get to see the art you know, it doesn't feel like it's mine, but it's just nice to actually get, to, you know, to yeah. handle it. You know, I mean, yeah. it's, uh, it's fun. I wish other I people could friend, experience um, it too. I have my friend, Steve Wyatt, who does shows out here in um, California. And is, mm -hmm. uh, well, you guys, if you guys ever go to Comic Con, he's always got a booth out there. Super, super good guy. One of my close friends, Steve um, is also a framer and he has framed, I don't know, a thousand pieces in his, in his career as a fl framer, maybe more. And he's framed for Zeta pieces and Bernie Wrightson pieces. And he, you know, they're in his his framer shop when he's working on them. So he gets to spend a lot of time with these these beautiful pieces that he's uh that he's um framed. And um that that must be pretty amazing, you know, uh just to be able to like have this stuff come through and look at it. That's true. No, I mean Steve's Steve's a great guy. He's uh he's he's an asset to Northern California and the comic yes. scene. Yes. For yeah. years, yeah. putting yeah. on different his own shows, uh, working with Big Wow. He still works uh -huh. with Morger on Como. I mean, yeah. he's one of my he favorite people in the business. Up, uh, he has a show coming up this month, San Jose, San Jose Con, which is a one-day show. Um, I won't be attending that one because I just got too much work stuff to do this time, but I usually do attend that. And um, he knows how to put on a convention, and he's a fun guy. He treats everybody uh, amazingly, everybody. You know, it's just. Oh, is in Southern California? I'm sorry, Marcus. I oh, was no, Northern here. California, Northern California. So San Jose is in the, in the East Bay. Yeah. Or the, uh, is it the East Bay? No, it's not the East Bay. It's the South Bay. But he does do an East Bay Comic Con. It's in Concord, California, which is pretty close to where I used to live when I was going to art school and actually where I grew up. <clears throat> he does that in the early in the year. So he has he has a good amount of, of shows. He keeps them manageable. He also does the uh, a Baker's still a comic show and an anime right. show. We got to keep moving. Yes, we do. We get because I've got I got a stack. Yeah. 
right mm -hmm. here. But uh, congrats to Wayne for picking up that last auction piece at $1,200. We uh, we appreciate it. Now we're getting into the fixed price stuff, everybody. I got 36 pieces to go through. Uh, and if I, I, I don't think I'm going to make myself a pointed deadline of uh, 40 minutes to get it done. But we can, we'll try. We'll see how this goes. Um, just remember that, uh, you know, if you buy, if you claim three pieces, yeah, you know, we want you to give your a self-imposed 20-second uh, count when we show new pieces after if you've claimed your first three. Uh, that way, more people are going to be able to get uh, the opportunity to walk away with some of Dan's art here. And uh, most of these pieces are in the sub $1,000 range. So uh, first piece is uh, this wonderful Electra. So let me go ahead and show the slide. This is uh, a lot number one. Uh, it's on 9 by 12 Price on this one is $550. Great pose, great color. I know you've got a little bit of silver paint in here. On, uh, uh, it doesn't look like well, a little bit on the hilt of the, the sword. And uh, I don't know if those are throwing stars near her chest, but uh, it's it's close. But uh, fun piece signed <laughs> on the front, not on the back. Yeah, um, I always try and like put the shuriken somewhere on her where she can get to them when she needs them, you know, because you have to imagine that. Ah. She's a ninja and she's not wearing a ton of clothing. Um, and there's not a lot of folds in her clothing. She must have stuff hidden everywhere. So, and, you know, and under th things that you don't see and sometimes things you do see. And I think I remember when uh, uh, Frank Miller did uh, the Electra Assassin graphic novel, he, I think he used the shuriken on her costume. And um, so I, I, I was always, I think my my first um, experience with her was, was uh, not Frank Miller's version, I think, but it was Bill Sienkiewicz. And then they went back and read all the, the Frank Miller stuff. But uh, I always liked Electra. I always wanted to work on that character. Howard Chaikin and I actually talked about doing an Electra story for Marvel at one point in the 90s. And this is before we'd done Thrill Killer. And I got a little bit of cold feet because I felt like, um, you know, this sort of felt like this is Frank's character. And I wouldn't want to do something that would go against what he was up to. And, and Howard didn't have any compunctions about that. And Nowadays it's different because obviously she's fair game for everybody. But at the time in the early nineties, it's, she didn't feel like fair game. Right. Well, we don't have a claim on this one. So we'll go ahead and uh, switch over to lot number two. Uh, we've got a uh, familiar character here for lot number two. This is uh, wonder woman reclined as you can tell. Uh, this one is on, uh, it's 14 by 11, 11 by 14. You get the idea. It's the, I think the only horizontal piece that we have today. Uh, this one's uh, priced yeah. at $500. Is that uh, is that right? Yeah, it's, it is the only horizontal uh, piece we've got. Uh, yeah, yeah. I don't, my, I don't know that people are clamoring for uh, horizontal, you know, um, landscape uh, format pieces that much. Um, and I do like to do reclined figures now and then, so that's kind of cool. It looks like Gabe is is Johnny on the spot with that. Thank you, Gabe. Yes, thank you so much, Gabe. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, and this one is signed on the back in pencil. It's got the D, uh, yeah. D, DB on the front and the full signature on the back. Someone told me not that long ago, I think it was James O'Barr. We talk almost every day. We text every day. And I was showing him a couple of pieces I had done. Um, maybe I even put something up on Facebook that was, you know, an ink and wash kind of thing. And he said, please do more. And um, it occurred to me that I do enjoy doing it. and but sometimes I have a this issue where you want to go ahead and do the next one. Um, nah, well, you know, I, hey, it's uh, well, let's show the next one now that I tease it. I'll try not to do that again. No, no, that's fine. That's fine. Let's go ahead and do that. All right. So this is uh, we had this one as Wonder Woman Ricochet. It's on 10 by 14 uh, and it's priced at 650. It's lot number three. Thanks for everybody for putting in the claim and the number on that first one. I know I didn't mention that, but obviously that helps. It certainly helps when you're going back to claim things after the fact. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, and this one's on this, it's not on the watercolor paper. It's on that smooth, uh, Bristol board. Yeah. Uh, it's a, it's, I think it's, um, it's either a Strathmore Bristol board or some other brand that not, not, I mean, it's not Strathmore. It's either uh, Windsor Newton or some other brand of Bristol. And I'm always trying to find, uh, work on different surfaces to see how I like them. And I do like this plate Bristol, this smoother Bristol. Um, you can't do a lot of background painting with it because the paper won't accept that. Um, but I also like doing more vignette stuff too. I think it's a good example of, um, of working on composition and, and putting elements together. And, um, I really like that one. Um, and it, I, uh, also it's hard not to put a little color in these things. So I do try right. and put 
a little accent of color without going too crazy with it. Sometimes. Sometimes well, there's, you can help there's it. definitely an accent to, uh, of color on this next one. Now, congrats to Matt James on that uh, claim. We do appreciate that. Um, so we'll go ahead and show the next lot you, here. This is uh, lot four. So uh, Silver Banshee on 11 by 14. This one is done on uh, uh, watercolor paper. So a bit of color on there in Soup's Cape, and it's signed on the front and the back. And this is uh, on 11 by 14. And uh, yeah, this one's, uh, you know, I, you know, I never, I never read a lot of Superman, but this, you know, her as a villain, I mean, she just has is an imposing figure. <laughs> I mean, well, when you look through back issues and you see, see her on the cover, uh, yeah, it's just like, wow, you know. She's uh, so stunning and she's a, she's a fun character. I, you know, I, I, John Byrne created her when he was doing a Superman run. And, um, and then there, later on, there was a Superman annual or no, it wasn't Superman annual. It was, it was a little later. There was an issue of Superman that Mike Mignola had drawn. I can't remember who wrote it. Apologies for that, but uh, it was Superman Silver Banshee again. And the character just was so cool and, and looked so much like so much fun to draw uh, that when it came time to do Legends of the World's Finest uh, with Walt Simonson writing, it was a three issue prestige, uh, fully painted a series that came out in the early nineties. Some of you may not have uh, caught it. And it's not in print. Um, they collect it as a trade paperback, which you can find on eBay or wherever. And you can probably find the individual issues. But I, I asked Walt if we could have her as a villain because he said, what do you want to draw? And I said, well, Man Bat would be cool. And <laughs> this is, I mean, Man Bat's in the story. There's a lot of other villains in the story. But Silver Banshee was someone I thought would be great in there. And um, yeah, so she's like, there's a connection there like that, that's kind of fun. All right. Well, that one has gone unclaimed. Uh, there was a question oh. in there if we have any interior pages today. No, we do not. No. Um, and Brian, uh, you can answer Brian Peck's question about have you ever used craft tint? Well, I'll go ahead and show a uh, lot five here. This is a, a Tiger on 11 by 14, and this is on the smooth bristle. It's priced at $600. Um, craft, craft tint, you mean uh, Zipatone or craft tint? I've used, I used Zipatone when I was in high school um, because I, for a while, I, I, before I got really heavily back into comics, I thought I wanted to do um, uh, comic strips. You know, I was around the time I was 11, 12, 13. I was, I was really into uh, Charles Schultz and Walt Kelly and even uh, Garfield. And I was cutting strips out and I was really into comic strips. I thought maybe I wanted to be a strip artist. And so I started playing around with Zipatone and the stuff I was doing. And uh, I, I even did some pieces later on. Um, where I would lay it down. And what I would do is I would cut out the pieces and lay it down and um, rather, and then kind of model that way uh, form uh, as opposed to just doing a flat kind of thing. And it was kind of fun, but then I just sort of tapered off into painting more in, in art school. Uh, but it's kind of hard to find now, isn't it? I mean, I don't know if people are still selling that stuff. Um, yeah, I think it's uh, out of production by and large. So, um, all right, well, lot five is still out there, everybody. I, I assume, and I always didn't say this when uh, show started. I do it on other shows, but take notes. You know which pieces are out there, and uh, you can claim at any time during the show. And uh, you know, so I expect you to do that, <laughs> taking notes. Uh, but we'll go ahead and take a look at lot six here. Lot six is uh, a man thing on eleven by fourteen. This one's priced at five fifty. And I know we did a man thing on the uh, first show. Yeah, and, and that one was. Uh, very nice as is this one this one's signed front and back yeah this one originally um was a uh, monochromatic uh, i think the only color was just his eyes i put red in his eyes and then i was looking at it um uh like you know a few weeks later or whatever and i thought you know i could i should add some some tint to this and so i tried to keep it very simple with the coloring and i actually like it a lot better now it says more man thing to me that's another character right it's um really uh gravitated toward when i was a kid mm -hmm. i first started reading marvel comics yeah nope same here i was always a horror fan growing up so uh uh you know I, and i wasn't reading dc so swamp thing just didn't uh didn't do anything for me and man thing mm -hmm. was it you know and man thing yeah, crossed so easy in so many books yeah it's funny because they were both created by roommates for two different companies and i i didn't really know anything about swamp thing until later and then I heavily got into Swamp Thing when I was in high school. You know, um, I have so many different versions of the Swamp Thing stuff here. 
the original issues and you know the collections and stuff love swamp thing love the whole story that um that lynn and uh and bernie did together uh but man thing is fun be and they're both fun because they're not they're monsters but they're sympathetic and i think that's I, for me like my favorite monsters are sympathetic you know um if you don't mess with him he's not going to mess with you he just wants to be left alone and uh, we do have a claim. Thank you. And then, oh, sorry, I was trying to highlight that one. Frank Robert Johnson. So Jerry Bourne got uh, lot six, the man thing. Thank you. And Frank Robert Johnson was a question about what is the object between her legs, her foot. It's the back of her foot. Oh, it's her foot. So she, yeah, she's leaning on her foot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is her foot. And that is the object in question. Yes, it is. And I thought, was there another question? Hey, Dan, have you ever read any of the Char Charlton Horror uh, piles of it? Uh, great Tom Sutton stuff in there. That's for sure. Um, I have, I have some of it and I, I, I would like to more do a, a deeper dive into that stuff. Cause I, I love Sutton stuff. And, um, I actually did a, a couple of covers for, um, black flame, which is, I think a book that he, not a book that he drew, but like a backup story he did for first comics. And they, they brought the character back and I got to do some of those covers and, uh, I always liked his horror stuff. And he was a very underrated, um, brilliant creator and storyteller and artist. So, but I would like to die. Speaking of horror. Speaking of horror. Yeah, lot number seven, Cynthia. This one's uh, on an uh, 11 and a half by 16 and a half. So, you know, this is a size that uh, we didn't do anything with uh, on in the first show, but Dan was doing some experimenting with, uh, with this paper. And so we have, I don't know, we probably have about eight pieces done on, on this size. So this one's priced at $700. And, uh, you know, again, it's funny. It's, it's, your the scan still doesn't do uh the piece you know it's you know the yellow is vibrant the uh, you have it it's, by, it's, <laughs> it's actually wider than 11 it's 11 and a half by 16 now but that's another thing too is to be able to do characters like this full figure and then have the room to do them and not have to feel like you squeeze a bunch of stuff in right i really play around more with the negative space and that's me also kind of trying to expand my range um by doing less sometimes you know um and this character, again, it didn't grow up with Cynthia because I wasn't reading, like you, I wasn't reading um, really very much DC comics. And I don't think I would have been interested in Witching Hour as a kid. But then later on, you start to get to know this stuff. But then people were asking me to do that. The first person to ask me to do Cynthia was Glenn Danzig. He commissioned a, a Cynthia painting for me in the 90s. And I was like, who's Cynthia? <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I get to do the deep dive into you know, Alex Toth and, and, and the Witches 3 and all this stuff. And, um, so, uh, so yeah, she's really fun to do. And I, I, she comes, comes out a little different every time I do her. Uh, well, it's, it's, she's a beauty on this one and, uh, uh, but we don't have a claim on it yet. So we're going to just move on to the next one. This on is, one. yep. The next one is a, a little bit more expensive. I, like I said, I didn't really go price range on these. I kind of moved things around a bit. Uh, this is lot eight price at $900. This is the, uh, Eve Warlock piece, uh, uh, on 11 by 14, this is done on watercolor board or watercolor board. It's, you know, watercolor paper. So it's on the heavier stock. Dan's got it uh, signed on the front and the back. And uh, talk about why you uh, did this one. Uh, it's first of all, it's, I think it's on um, uh, liquid. It's on, it's on a hundred percent rag uh, watercolor paper, hundred percent cotton rag. Yes. So it has a kind of a slightly different um, texture to it. It takes the uh, paint a little differently. And I really didn't want to do too much uh, color on it. I, I just like the focus for this piece. I wanted to focus on her colors. And um, that's one of the reasons why I think it's, for me, it's it's comes off very, very strong that way. Um, I like how it came out. Uh, but uh, I, I can't remember. I think I saw Ron Lim's work on, uh, Ron, Ron's out here in Sacramento too. And a uh, good friend, good guy. And uh, saw his work. Um, with this female version of, of Warlock that I didn't know had previously existed. And I thought, that's cool. I mean, maybe I'll, maybe I'll take a stab at doing that. And um, it was kind of fun, you know? Um, I like the idea of doing these gender uh, role reversals with characters to see how they look, you know, how would that look? And to see someone else do it like that, I thought was cool. And the way that they changed some of the things in the costume and was kind of neat, like that spear, that thing that she's carrying around yeah and capes are fun capes are uh, a great element to put into your work uh to to kind of 
to uh, add and enhance the composition. So whenever there's a cape to be drawn, I'm, I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so this one's still out there. We have uh, the next piece is one of those uh, gender uh, experiments that you, uh -huh. uh, you, you mentioned. So this, so lot eight is still available. Lot nine, we have a lady creeper. And again, it's on that larger format that it 11 and a half by 16 and a half. This one's priced at 650. And again, this is, a, and you know, the, the paper is more of a, it's like a smooth Bristol, uh, like uh, Dan mentioned yeah. earlier. It's a, it's a Windsor Newton Bristol. And I think the reason it's 11 and a half by 16 and a half is because it's a British uh, size. It's different from the way we size paper. Um, and it was one of those Bristol uh, papers that I was, I was testing out. And I, I like, I like drawing on it. I like the size too. No, well, there it's, uh, you know, definitely an impressive size compared to like the uh, nine by 12s or 11 by 14s. But, yeah. Uh, the... And you know, the, the, I've done the creeper as a female character a couple of times. And um, I always, I always, I always think, you know, how would she look as a girl, you know, or how would he look or how does the character look as, as a female? And it's kind of fun because um, it almost feels to me like um, as wild as Dicko was with coming up with the idea of a guy who just threw a costume together. Um, which I think is a great, great concept. Um, I, I I just wanted to throw something more in there and and uh, ch and ch change the gender and stuff like that. So when I do these pieces, I don't really have like a necessarily always a an idea in mind of what I want to do. So I wanted to put her on some kind of a really weird looking gargoyle that is definitely not something you would see in your average city then in but it's in the context of what looks like she's in an urban setting so it's kind of it's the whole thing is kind of creepy and weird in, in a way it's off it's just slightly off and that's i think that's why i like it yeah all right well this one's still available too lot number nine lady creeper now we're switching back to uh to marvel here with lot number 10 with ms marvel now this one's on 11 by 14 bristol this one's priced at 600 dollars. signed front only and uh, I think we had a, we had a Miss Marvel in the last one too, if I'm not mistaken. She kind of was in a, a seated, mm -hmm. relaxed pose. So now, yeah, she, on the side of a building or something. Yeah, she's yeah. a great character. She's so fun to draw. Um, I think when that she debuted, I think I was in. It was like '77, maybe. I think I was firmly entrenched in the worlds of Tolkien and um, and Star Wars and reading comics left less but i do remember when this character like hit the stands and it's pretty striking obviously um and i always like this this uh this costume with the uh scarf and her kind of uh 70s hair <laughs> yeah so i'll probably nope. do her again sometime but she's fun to do i uh i'd say this is probably my favorite but, you know because that's right around that time you know I, marcus just mentioned it's a cockroom costume you know, that yeah. during, during the period when uh, her first series came out, I mean, that's that's the most memorable to me. Yeah, uh, so she was originally the first three issues I think were drawn by John Buscema. So I I had kind of thought that maybe he designed the costume, but it makes definitely more uh, sense that it would be a Cockrum design. And he, Cockrum was uh, he was second only maybe to Kirby in in, in his um you know, his, uh, his design sensibility and the way he was able to, I mean, look at the, look at the new X-Men characters he came up with. So there's no one else who's going to go in that direction, but him. No, you know? no, not at all. Uh, yeah, Cockrum is very underrated as a, uh, uh, thank you, character designer. Yes. Thank you, Ronald as well. You've got uh, good taste on that one. Lot number 10 yeah. goes Enjoy to that. you. Let's see. I'll go over here to lot 11 now. And I, Alberto's given me the, he's, he's keeping tabs on the time for me. Yeah. Thank you, Alberto. I do appreciate that. Uh, lot 11 now. This is uh, Evening Gray, priced to $500 on 11 by 14. This is, uh, again, on the on the smooth Bristol. Yeah, I, uh, one of my favorite characters to draw, obviously. Um, you don't really get tired of doing Halloween Girl. She's very, she's like a member of our family. When um, our daughter was born in 2019, before she was born um our daughter cassidy we were trying to come up with names and evening was on the list and I, eventually we eventually crossed it off the list because we thought well this feels like we already have an evening in the family so that would be redundant so so yeah so she's she stands on her own even though she's based on um my uh my daughter uh uh lindsay uh who told me that when she was four years old that um i asked her what do you want to dress up 
for on Halloween and she said, you know, for trick or treating and stuff. And she said, Hmm. Oh, I know. I want to be Halloween girl. And I said, <laughs> no, 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 honey, that's not wait. And then I went, Holy crap. And this just idea just jumped into my head. So I remember drawing this character in my sketchbooks uh, next to a prototypical gun, witch character. And then later on, they ended up showing up in nocturnals, but um, yeah, she's always fun to do. And I'm working on the next Nocturnals graphic novel now when I can. It's um, it's it's penciled, 96 pages. It'll be done as a Kickstarter hardcover graphic novel. Um, so yeah, it's fun. Well, looking forward to that. What, what's a what's the timeline on that one? Uh, I don't know because I have to kind of find the time to do it because I'm not um, I'm not doing it for a, a publisher right now. Although Dark Horse would probably pick it up at some point down the road, like they did with mm -hmm. the omnibuses um but uh it's it would be part two of a a, 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 a trilogy because the first one would be sinister path which came out in 2017 2018 or whatever that was and then um and then there'd be one more after this and then they'd be collected into a, a, an omnibus so cool oh here's another, here's another halloween girl that's why i figured i'd, I'd just yeah. swing over to this one for lot 12 this one's 700 dollars uh it is 11 by 17 and on that uh smooth board again I love the little ghost coming out of uh, the pumpkin there. <laughs> yeah, she's, um, again, I mean, I don't get tired of doing her. And this one, she's more regal and queen-like, I think, which kind of feeds into the storyline that I'm doing right now, um, which I'm not going to talk about. But other than to say that in this piece, I wanted her to look more imposing and, and sort of queen-like. Um, and that's the fun thing about her is I can do her in different ways. I can make her look younger and make her a little bit older, even though her character, her does, her character does age from story to story, but not, not very much, you know? So I always want to kind of keep her in a certain range as a kid, because she's a kid. Sure. No, I love this piece. And I, I think you uh, achieved the, the regal quality you were going after on it. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Spooky time vibe says Ryan Peters. And Dark Phoenix says that she is excited for the new Nocturnals. So, uh, me too. Believe me, I'm wanted... excited to, to carve out more time to work on finishing these pages. For sure. All right. Well, that one's still out there. We're going to move over to lot 13 next. And this is a beauty. This is uh, done on 11 by 17 as well. Priced at $700. Uh, Vampirella has never never looked so uh, desirable in, the, uh, in, a, in a graveyard as, as she does on this piece. Well, you know. If you're gonna go to the graveyard in the middle of the night, this is the way to dress, I guess. I mean, I've always wondered about her character, like how, what's the best way to make her more, um, what's the word, uh, legitimate, rather than just being a kind of a bikini clad vampire hostess, which I think is fine. That's fine. Uh, that's how she was kind of conceived. And, and I don't think that you need to, to, to veer away from that. But in the past, I've written some Vampirella stuff where I've tried to play around with ideas for what I could what you could do with her her character and she's just she's always fun to to work on so my last thing I did was um years ago I did a a three or four issue mini series called uh, the red room and then I wrote that and did the covers for it and I also designed all the monsters and characters and stuff for it for dynamite well, thank you uh Rancor Hawk for picking that one up oh good job thank you yeah uh now we talked about uh, this character a little bit ago thrill killer bat girl this is lot 14 priced at 650 dollars on 11 by 14 smooth bristol again sign front only um got we got our bats like we get in a lot of your pieces now now i know where you you just have to look up and you have your inspiration for you know <laughs> for them. i have brought this up with especially people on my patreon page i've asked them you know, it, let me know when it gets to be too much. And no one has come forward and said that uh, they, for one, would like to see less of it. But the thing is, is putting things into composition that are moving around. Uh, well, first of all, the moon is a great compositional framing element that's just never going to go away. Sorry, it's just too, it's too, too, too choice. And it's, it's, um, it's a great friend of the artist when you're trying to compose something. But uh, the bats and the leaves and the clouds and mist and all those kinds of things, even the even the kind of rooftop uh, vent systems that you can play around with, they all kind of help put the composition together to to support the picture as a whole. And when you when you place them around, you want to place them in a way that your eye finds it uh, easy to move around the page and not get stuck anywhere. 
So it's just too, it's just a great tool. All right. Well, this is, I, I love this piece. And I, I saw Anthony uh, Rubo was trying to like effectively maybe bid on the uh, prior lot, but we don't, this isn't bidding right now, Anthony, all, all the pieces we're showing now are fixed prices. So the first person to claim the piece gets the piece. Uh, but we appreciate the sentiment, but yeah, this is, uh, these are fixed price pieces right now. So, uh, so this piece is still out there. Lot 14 at 650 throw killer back girl, but, uh, we do have a, uh, a second one here if you're a fan and let me show that one here. This is lot 15. Now this is on the bigger board again, and, uh, this is a throw killer again, and this is priced at 650. And you now again, the, the, when you, when you put the two together, I mean, this one, you know, is such a bigger it's you know character on the page very very you know this is like cover quality when you look at it it's love love the size of the piece so uh and you know and you always put the emphasis in the right places I mean, you put a little bit of extra work in uh, in her face right i mean it just kind of draws your attention to her so uh this is a gorgeous piece well again i'm trying to kind of straddle between being simple and uh and, and solid and effective and and give some like again, feeling a movement to the to the piece, and, and you got that weird sort of gargoyle again. Not the same one, but a different one. Um, that's another thing too. It's kind of funny. Is like there's different ways to do gargoyles. You can draw them completely fancifully, or you can look something. You can look at uh, examples of more traditional ones and try and go with that. Um, and I like to do both. So it's for stuff like this. Is no one's um, specifically telling me not to. So why not? Right. But yeah, I also like the size. It's a good size. So, all right. Well, this one is uh, still available. Jeffrey Moy, I guess, owns one of your Thrill Killer pages, and yeah, you should post it to your cap, Jeffrey. We'd all love to see it. Yeah, I would definitely like to see it. Jeffrey, can you send me a scan of it for JPEG or something? I'd like to see what you have. All right, moving right along. I don't have any scans of Thrill Killer pages that I sold. I don't. There's a lot of art that I don't have scans for. Well, that's it's too bad. Just, well, I didn't own a scanner at the time. It used to just send them into to D, to DC or whoever, and mm -hmm. get them back uh, months and months later. <laughs> well, he says he will take care of you on that one. Thank you, buddy. Um, yeah. So next up, we have lot sixteen, priced at six hundred dollars. It's a uh, dark phoenix on a heavier, uh, heavier board. I think it's watercolor, but it is definitely a heavier uh, paper. So it could be watercolor. Uh, it's uh, eleven by thirteen and a half. I think and, it might be a Strathmore uh, mixed media board or something like that. Um, yeah, so uh, it's a little bit heavier. Um, I still didn't want to do, again, trying to do stuff that's uh, a little simpler and uh, within people's budgets and still pay attention to things like lighting and the and the and the core colors that that you want to see there. And also, when I do Jean Grey or I do Dark Phoenix, I I don't always just necessarily want to just do a sexy gal. Sometimes I want her to be kind of frightening, you know, because that's the way that John Byrne was drawing her half the time in the story is frightening kind of um, alien entity. So you try and straddle that line. Yeah, she definitely appears possessed in that one. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> uh, and Dark Phoenix mentions that uh, she's been waiting to see this beauty. Um, <laughs> and uh, Marcelo uh, Mota has claimed lot 16. Thank you, Marcelo. Awesome. Thank you, Marcelo. Congratulations. And uh, just a reminder to everybody after the show is over, you know, you'll be emailing me, Bill at ComicArtFans.com, uh, with your contact information and any of the, the lot numbers that you've claimed, include your mailing address, all those sorts of things. But, uh, you know, and or if you have to leave early, I'm reminding you, you need to email me. I already got an email from EC Harris letting me know. Uh, how he wants to pay and including his mailing address. So uh, thank you for that. I appreciate it. Um, next up, lot 17. And it's another Dark Phoenix at the same price, but a different size, different different mm -hmm. pose. I mean, this is a really fun piece. This is on 11 by 17, uh, the smooth Bristol. But, uh, you know, you, you don't get you don't get the, the uh, Phoenix effect around her. But, you no. know, the piece doesn't really need it. I mean, the way you've done the lighting on the, uh, uh, you know, on her uh, chest and her hair, I mean, all those things. I mean, it just makes this piece, uh, you know, really, really dynamic in its own way. It does. It doesn't need a background. No, I mean, you can imagine she's in the midst of a gigantic planet-wide uh, energy effect. So it would just be blinding white light behind her, uh, and so you have that kind of light sources on both sides, and um, 
and you can go crazy with your hair. You can you can make her hair just keep going and going and going, you know. But uh, yeah, I'm I'm actually partial to this one. I like this one. No, I am too. I mean, she seems very malevolent in this, uh, you know, in this piece. You can just imagine the. Uh, <laughs> she's definitely, uh, you know, doing something uh, devilish, you know, uh, in this. Oh, and uh, we do have a claim from Andrew Hanna. Thank you so much, Andrew. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah. And, and I, I will let everybody know there is another uh, Dark Phoenix out there uh, later in the show. Later. But uh, we'll move That's over right. to, uh, right. yeah, a little Not different pose. I didn't plan to do three. It just happened. Yeah. yeah. So lot 18 is next. We've got uh, the Satana or Satana, however you'd like to pronounce it, on 11 by 14 smooth bristle. This one's priced at 650 And, uh, you know, this one works well with the, uh, you know, that heavy dark background edge to edge on it. I love the, the, who knows what this creature uh, that you know whose skull it belonged to she's sitting on but uh, but it just adds that extra fun interesting element to it and how often do you get to see this character out in the wild right not not too often yeah it's true and there's different ways to do her she's because she's got the different looks and costumes and she's got horns or she's got this or that um i kind of like i i'm sort of partial to the john ramita's version it's just kind of really simple um uh and i have wanted to do when it makes sense to do more pieces where it's up just a black background but if you look you, you can see where i'm not doing a flat i, I make the decision not to do it just a flat black background right uh, i could do that but sometimes i feel when you're looking at the piece in person it's too heavy you know um but uh yeah i've done her quite a few times and uh whether it's voluntarily or, or or just i mean on my own or if it's a commission but uh she's just fun and again it's these these um, simple costumes are, are really cool to do. And that creature who's she's skull she's straddling is, I, I, don't, I don't really know what to tell you about that, except that it's probably something that is down in the depths of hell. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I like it. And, you know, and that's part of, uh, I, you know, I like the way your, your, your treatment in the background here as well. You know, Mignola does a lot of like layering of washes and things in his backgrounds. Yeah. And it's always some of the most interesting things that he, I mean, I love his art, but I love just kind of looking through the backgrounds and how he decides to treat the, the shadows, mists, those yeah. sorts of things, because he does a lot of layering. And that's, you know, that's exactly what's appealing about this piece, too. A lot of times when I'm doing that stuff, I find um, I find things in there that I want to push a little more. Like a lot of times you'll see death faces, you know, skulls, you know, uh, the death's head uh, in either a rudimentary form or it's almost there. And then you'll go in and you'll add a little spot here and there. And, all of a sudden, you've got all these skulls in the background, and you didn't realize. <laughs> you didn't. You kind of bring them out a little bit. Well, it makes you it makes you look a little bit closer at some of the pieces too. I mean, I, I forget which piece earlier there was, but I was looking for skulls in the uh, mist behind behind the character. Um, so next up is lot nineteen, price at six fifty. Black Widow on eleven by fourteen, smooth Bristol again. Uh, again, you know, Black Widow has had many costumes over her career. This would be the one that I most, uh, you know associate with her because yeah. so this this is when i started reading so uh yeah really nice piece here that the piled up hair and um again you know here we go you see indeed the there? where is she yeah um john basema gene colin um george perez in, yeah you know. yeah uh but that sort of piled up sort of uh 60s do and um and this you know obviously it's like the 70s when i'm reading comics and Daredevil and Black Widow are this couple going around fighting crime. And how, how fun was that? You know, it's just so great. To, um, and again, simple costume. You know, I don't always go for a simple costume. Obviously, Hella's costume is the opposite of simple. But um, what great designs, you know. Agreed. Uh, thank you, Gabe, for picking this one up. And awesome. I thought Anthony asked a question about any more vampy coming up. Yes, there is one more vampy in the, uh, uh, like, maybe 10 pieces from now. So uh, let's go over to lot 20 now. We've got a Lilith piece, and uh, this one is on the Smooth Bristol. It's priced 650 on 11 by 14 Just uh, another fun piece. Another skull signed on the front and the back. More, more tombstones, tumbling tombstones. Again, that's another thing that's fun to draw. Um, a lot of times older graveyards have uh, these tombstones that are falling on top of each other and because they just aren't being um, cared for anymore. They're so old. 
or there's sections of older sections of uh, like in Oakland though there's a huge cemetery in Oakland that's got parts of it when I was going to art school we would we would walk over there and we would draw and paint and stuff and um, there were sections of this rambling um, cemetery where bramble and vines and trees have taken over. And you can't even get in there. And the tombstones are just all falling around. They've got stuff cover curled. And that, that, that imagery, I'd, I never would have expected to see that because I didn't go to a lot. I think it was the first time I'd ever went to a, an actual old cemetery. And um, it's so captivating. And it's, I'll never forget all that stuff. But it really does exist. You know, it's out there. And some of you, I'm sure, have seen, seen places like that. Yeah, Marcus mentions Piedmont. I don't know. I know he's uh, yeah, California. Yeah, that's exactly. You know, yeah, it's at the end of Piedmont. Uh huh. Yeah, right. it's a major necropolis for sure. Yeah. All right. Definitely well, it's, it too. If you can, we you will know. see more tombstones. I know that before we're done yeah. here. <laughs> and more bats. Yes, and more bats and skulls. Uh, so this one's still available, lot 20. So next up is lot 21. This one's uh, what, 9 by 12, and it's pr priced at $400. I think it's probably the. Uh, the, the least expensive piece we have tonight, but uh, yeah, I love the love the orange as a as a backdrop to the character. It's it's fun. I think we had a swamp thing in the uh, first show as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the signed okay, signed front only. Check yeah, definitely, uh, definitely. You know, Bernie Wrights and influence is strong. Whenever I'm doing this character, it's like it's my chance to kind of um, you know uh, play in that universe. You know, it's so really fun that look in his eyes. Heck yeah. so, Rick, thank you. Yes. Congratulations, Rick Welch. First claim of the day. We appreciate it. I know, uh, yeah, that, that character is right up your alley. Um, all right. We'll take a look at lot 22 next. This one's on 11 by 14, Smooth Bristol. Again, this one is uh, $550. You've got uh, Harley Quinn on it, of course. It says uh, it's lights out on the baseball bat. So, uh, yeah. You, while she looks like she's relaxing, she's she's uh, she could bash your brains in the next moment. <laughs> uh, this one's signed front and back as well, and, uh, and a nice piece again. Another piece that doesn't really need a background on it, right? Uh, uh, no, I mean it's more of a vignette like some of these other ones. And uh, like I said, it's uh, with this paper. It, the paper tells you not to. It says, "Please don't put color on me and paint because I will buckle and warp and." And to be honest, I, I, I like that limitation because it, you know, I mean, if you guys know my work, you know that I'm not necessarily doing these kind of vignette pieces very often where there's a lot of open space. And so it's a great way for me to kind of play and and concentrate on the figure. You know, the other pieces that there were only about four pieces like this in the last show that they all sold and they were all very similar. They were very simple, compact. And I try and keep everything compact and not have the characters spread all over the page and to sort of group everything together. And it's, I like, I like that. I like, yeah. uh, I like the, uh, you know, Brett Mixon saying there's a different kind of bat on this one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's true. I did avoid the, um, the moon and the bat and all that other stuff, but just, yeah. just this once. <laughs> all right. Well, this one's still out there. Uh, lot 22 at $550. Next up, we've got lot 23. This is Lady Bullseye, and this is on the uh, larger format uh, paper, 11 and a half by 16 and a half. And again, uh, it doesn't need a background. It's it's a striking piece all by itself and uh, signed on the front DB, uh, but uh, not signed on the back. So uh, but this is a uh, show. I'll sign the back of it if it matters to you. But that is that was my shorthand. Um signature that i sometimes use it's it doesn't mean that i'm any less invested or not in the piece it's just right yeah well i uh nothing wrong with signing things db at all i don't uh oh. you know i i like it lowercase looks good that was my uh my sh my trading card signature that i came up with when i was doing i did a whole bunch of x-men trading cards uh for the fleer set 94 mm -hmm. and i would do these uh signings at comic shops and and or even at conventions and people bring up like the whole set and i'd done like 15 cards for that set and sometimes brings people bring multiples so they had 40 a stack of 45 cards for me to sign and so i just started doing the db and then after a while the d and the b i, tr I tried to kind of design them in a way that made sense as a you know kind of a, not just a, a signature but as a, a trademark you know so it is sure. kind of a trade uh, well, I like it. So this is uh, 23, lot 23, still available for $500. Now uh, we're going to show lot 24 here. This is our second Lividia with with the uh, top hat on this time. On the This one's on the heavier board, 
not not watercolor but something you know definitely uh with a lot more weight to it this is a uh, an 11 by 13 and a half priced at 600 yeah, dollars some kind of i think it's strathmore mixed media paper or something like that yeah yeah but you get all you get everything you get the bats you got the tombstones and you get the skull and there's a little color in there too if you guys look closely there's a that little is true. There, interface a uh in the blue and the uh those uh, armbands because i even, often can't. even in the eyeball and the skull <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> that's that um what is it? The, uh, the eye and the skull goes back really far. That whole idea. That yeah, this is a fun one. Signed on the back too, and the front. And she's nice. a kind of new character that you'll probably see more of. It's kind of carnival goth girl. Hey, Jimmy Palmiotti's in the audience. Hey, Jimmy. Hey, Jimmy. Thank you, buddy. It was great to see you in Connecticut. You're going to get to see Jimmy in Orlando in uh, January, too. Yeah. Yeah, it was great to see Jimmy and Amanda. And it's just really, that's like, especially after pandemic, you know, just being able to catch up with people again. So great. Thanks for coming on, Jimmy. <laughs> well, this one uh, is still available. Lot 24, priced at $600. Let's uh, take a look at the next one. A Batman on 11 by 14. That This is on Smooth Bristol. Signed on the front only. Now this one definitely is. Uh, it's all ink wash. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't see any color on this one. But uh, no. great image, classic image of Batman, of course. Batman Noir. Yes. And um, uh, yeah, I mean, it, I I love this image. I don't think it really needed anything else, so I didn't put it on there. I mean, you you could say that sometimes um, the addition of color is a nice accent, but sometimes maybe, I don't know, maybe there's an insecure artist in there that thinks they need to, that I'm mean, my, when I say they, I mean me, that, that I need to um, enhance it somehow. Um, but this time around, I just didn't feel that at all. I was trying to be um, pretty sparing with uh, how dark I would get in certain places and, you know, just kept going back and doing layers of uh, gray tones and stuff on it. So yeah. it was where I liked it. And you do uh, draw a mean cape. <laughs> I love it. Easy cape. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's it, it's it's cool, man. Um, yeah, Jeffrey Moy says classic bat. That's true. Very classic yeah. image for Batman. Um, all right, so 25, lot 25 is still out there at $600. Now, uh, there, and there is another Batman coming up. Not next, but uh, rather soon. Uh, but next up, we have this uh, bride image. It's lot 26, priced at $500. Uh, you, you get a little nudity in this one, suggested. Uh, it's on 11 by 14, smooth Bristol. Uh, I think we had a bride in the last uh, piece that uh, didn't really have much background on it. This one has, uh, you know, it's pretty much full backgrounds. Really nice. You get her on the, uh, you get her on the table. So uh, I mean, what more can you ask for if you're a fan of uh, this genre and these characters, right? <laughs> Uh, I love this. Uh, I love doing uh, the Bride of Frankenstein. I guess I have my own sort of uh, take on her that I like to do. And um, again, this is one of these characters that just never gets old. You know, mm -hmm. it's always fun to to draw. All right, uh, Gabe Carino's got to leave. So uh, thank you, Gabe, for your pickups today. Thank you, Gabe. Uh, I appreciate it as always. Yes, and she does have a new hairdo as well. You got that right, uh, Marcus. <laughs> Well, that's the thing is I just pile it up, you know, uh, <laughs> style. Wayne, that's funny. Yeah, Bill After Dark, getting her on the table. Hey, she's maybe she's getting <laughs> off the table. Maybe, you know, maybe they were just doing some modifications to her. I don't she's know. She's about to get off the table. She's not going back. <laughs> but she is drop dead gorgeous for a uh, corpse who's been uh, reassembled. Uh, mm -hmm. She, you know, Dr. Frankenstein knows what he's doing. Um all right, so this one's still out there. Lot twenty six. We got ten more to go, everybody. I know I'm past my what my self proclaimed uh, imposed two hour limit, and I've, I've learned. You know, I'm still learning as I go through this. But we're you it's know, my we're fault. Doing... Just so you guys know. No, no. Well, we, we I, you know, the thing is, we start talking, and I kind of lose track of time. But uh, lot twenty seven now. This is a uh, this is a, a very nice Batman on eleven by thirteen and a half uh, heavy board. This is uh, priced at seven fifty. Obviously, uh, whereas the other one was all straight ink wash. We've got color in this one. We've got more background. We 
You got the rooftops. It's signed. It's signed on uh, one of the chimneys there. It's signed on the back. Uh, you know, just a, a great piece, uh, you know, for any Batman fan that's out there. Love the shading and uh, lighting on this one. I mean, it's a striking piece. Yeah, um, he's a little more severe in this one, too. His, uh, his features, his facial features are a little more severe. Um, can you tell I like to draw the rooftops? I mean, when I was in Como, when I was in Como, um, I, we had this room that looked out over, uh, you know, like the, the hills of Chernobyl and all the, the, the buildings and stuff. And you could see into some people's sort of yards in their little patio areas. And then looking out over the, our, the window of our room, you could see like part of the roof and a lot of the roofs are like orange, um, uh, orange clay tile. And then they have these same color painted um uh vents that come out and so i took pictures of that and i was drawing those and so yeah that stuff is uh really fun to draw and i think if you can capture something that it doesn't just look like a stovepipe that has a kind of um like those like the ones you're seeing are, are kind of similar to the ones that uh that were in uh, italy uh that's just those little details they just they um they're so great to be able to put into a piece you know no, I agree. Yeah, this is, uh, yeah, you're right. It's rooftops or it's cemeteries, but uh, that's a, it's a great image. And, uh, you know, we will see it in the recap when we get there. Um, and as everybody knows, when we get to the recap, before we even start, anybody that's uh, been taking notes, these pieces that they like, uh, they're able to claim before we even get in and start the recap. So next up is lot 28. That's the uh, Black Panther piece. Uh, I know we didn't have a Black Panther the first time around. So this is on the larger board, 11 and a half by uh, 16 and a half smooth Bristol priced at $600. See, so we get a jungle scene this time, a little different. Uh, Some, uh, jungle action and a, on a, and a nice open piece, you know, it's, uh, plenty of background and, and open space. So, and again, it's more of a kind of a value study lighting and, and, um, spotting what you call spotting blacks. Um, so love the black Panther. I've always, again, one of my favorite characters going back to, like when I was eight years old, it's such a great yeah. And as a character with you know just this um, this flat colored costume, it's tough to uh, you know to to make them unique all the time. I mean, I think it, you know, it's a challenging character to uh, to work on, but um, but I think that that probably makes any artist that's working on the character you know just more jazzed about taking you know having yeah. that opportunity to try to make it work right. Well, yeah, it's true. It's, you know, you're playing around with lighting and shapes and stuff like that. And, um, and also the poses and, and getting across a feeling of movement or something. Um, I was looking at uh, a lot of Jack Kirby's um, Black Panther work for this one as, a, as kind of an inspiration. And the way he would, and obviously his lighting and his, his, uh, the way he would do his black shapes is different from the way I would do them. But there was still this kind of feeling of, um, of this, how Kirby just would um, come at things so much differently from a completely different perspective yeah. than anyone else. And that's what built the Marvel Universe, you know, that perspective. That is true. All right, we got eight more pieces to look at. They are all color pieces. So uh, shifting gears a bit to uh, to wrap up the uh, fixed price stuff. So lot 29 is on 11 by 14 uh, watercolor board. And it is a polychrome, of course, priced at $1,000. I mean, it's, it's gorgeous. You know, I, 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 you know, again, I, 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 it, this thing's edge to edge. It's just, you know, it's it's impressive to see. You know, you put a lot of detail into these uh, these some of these color pieces, and that's uh, uh, and this this one definitely you can tell how much time and effort you put in. There's some touches of uh, some gold paint in here, in that uh, uh, the figures, the faces on the waistband, uh, necklace, the the moon and star shapes around her face. I mean, it's it's a really really brilliant piece. Signs front and back. The um the flowers that are in her hair are night blooming flowers. I can't remember what they're called, but they're an actual night blooming uh, variety because I've been looking into that stuff more. And um I kind of I'm I added the uh, the pattern on her skirt last. That was the last thing I did. Um, and the uh, the tombstone that's in the lower left has this kind of um, decaying quality with this uh, reflected uh, kind of warm light that you see. And um, those little things are like, just like get caught up in those. And, and um, but just enough to, to, again, to support the, the art and not go too crazy with it. So yeah, this was fun to do. Just another character I love to do from the Nocturnals. 
absolutely no no it's it's really beautiful i mean as a as a full finished piece it's uh yeah it's again one of my favorites out of the set here so so that one is still out there we can take a look at lot 30 next this is a smaller piece but uh gorgeous um lot 30 is priced at 450 dollars. it's on 9 by 12 uh and uh, it's price uh, it's poison ivy of course and uh, yeah really nice and this one's kind of this paper has a bit of a tooth so it's not that smooth uh the smoother board but uh definitely something for mixed media but i mean i love this piece dan i mean uh, as a you know as, a, as, a, as an affordable piece to put out there the, this is great yeah um i really like doing these um I, it's not something i would necessarily choose to do as a torso or bus shot but i was um I have a rep, uh, Filippo, uh, who uh, he's comics rep on on the Facebook and, and Instagram, and um, he'll, he'll take pre-show commissions for like uh, Baltimore coming up. And I uh, we became acquainted b just before Como. He's a really good guy, and um, he had uh, gotten some commissions for me, including a, a Poison Ivy uh, bust. But when I do the bust, I tend to go further with a female character. I wonder why. And um, so really it's a torso. Uh, and I said, you know, I, I think I'm, I think I'm losing the whole point of what these are supposed to be a little bit, you know, putting in hands and, 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 and arms and things like that. So mm -hmm. I was kind of going past my brief of doing a, a, a bust, which is the head and shoulders, basically, maybe a little bit of the chest, but you know, I mean, that's the thing is the, the, the drawing sometimes tells you where it wants you to go. You know, it's right. not, it's not like a, a rigid thing. But um, again, this character is fun to do. Um, there are certain characters that you always feel like you're trying to capture something uh, elusive about them, um, and at the same time, uh, at the same time, um, make them recognizable and and pay homage to uh, the, their designers. You know. All right. Well, it is. Uh, it, it's still available. Jeffrey Moy says, yep, get inspired. I agree. So lot 3450 is still out there. We will take a look at lot 31 next. This is the uh, last Bamparella. It's on uh, 11 by 14 and it is priced at $800. You get Tombstone again, of course, but uh, a great image of Vampy and her big collar. I think Marcus pointed out the size of the collar last time. We love to look at characters with collars around here, but yeah, uh, but this one's fun. It does, you know. I don't, you know, the white is perfect around her because it just, you know, because you want to focus on the character in this piece. Yeah, um, it's uh, and there's plenty of color uh, where it counts. So even in the little areas uh, where you might not expect it, like in the tombstones, I like to put a little bit of color in there. Uh, you know, to just make something gray all the time. Oh, it's a tombstone, so it just be, should be gray or should be blue gray. Not necessarily, you know. Um, a lot of times you, you see a lot of color variation in old stone and stuff like that. Um, and as far as the collar goes, it's just cool to play around some of these. I mean, if you have a collar to draw, you might as well make it work for you, you know. Um, and then I like to add the, the Frazetta tattoo here and there sometimes. <laughs> on the, on the... <laughs> no, it's... Uh, it's... Yeah, and, and again, it's so much warmer as a painting, you know, in in person than than a scan can ever do it justice. The orange and the you know, and the moon behind her, her costume, even in the you know the way you've uh, you're handling the lighting on her shoulders and stuff, it's just yeah, it's gorgeous. Yeah, thanks. And well, sign front and back, uh, and uh, so this one's still out there too. Last Vampirella of the night. Now uh, this is a different one coming up here, and. Uh, I know we didn't have a nebula in last. We had a Gamora in the the last show, so we have yeah, nebula this time uh, around. The Starlin version of Gamora. Um, but uh, when I in anticipation of uh, Guardians of the Galaxy, I was watching uh, uh, the, the first two films and the Christmas special. Uh, I just kept going back to them and was so excited for the new movie. And um, part of that was because I was having all this uh, feeling some anxiety and stress pre Como. And so I was kind of diving into the Guardians of the Galaxy as a kind of release. And I knew I couldn't see the third film until after I got back from Como later in May. Um, but Nebula just turns out to be right at that point in time was like one of my favorite characters. I was starting to have more of an appreciation for her and also Mantis. And so I did a Nebula piece around that time. But uh, yeah, um, I actually have gone back a few times and played around with uh, her visage and... Um, Kind of pushing the colors a little bit uh, before I, I send it off to Bill. 
Yeah, no, I like this one a lot. And as uh, Jeff cameo, and, uh, did you notice the cameo? This Thanos's head. Uh, Jeff Jeff pointed that out. Yeah, I mean, this is <laughs> yeah. a fun piece. <laughs> Definitely a fun piece. Yeah, Andrew some, Hanover. Some monument to Thanos that Thanos, no doubt, uh, you know, commissioned. Definitely. No, that's a good one. And so, uh, so this one's still available. Lot 32. We got uh, four more to go here before we recap things. So uh, this is that uh, In Your Face Dark Phoenix piece. This is lot 33. Price is $800. This is on uh, watercolor board. And uh, it's on 11 by 14. Signed front only. But uh, yeah, this one's awesome. You know, I mean, you know, if the other ones were imposing, you know, this one, she's doing some damage somewhere. <laughs> Yeah, again, it's just um, it's an exercise in what you want to do with the hair and the lighting. And, and again, a simple costume doesn't necessarily mean that you do a simple drawing. So, right. Uh, and this okay. time you, just, uh, you do get colors on it because it's on watercolor paper. And uh, just so everybody knows, Winter Powell did claim. Oh, the, awesome. Uh, Thank you, Winter. Uh, good to see you. Uh, the Nebula. Sorry. Got the Nebula. Thank you so much, Winter Powell. Oh, Winter got the Nebula. Awesome. Yes, yes, she did. Um, and Dark Phoenix says, oof, gorgeous again. Yes, <laughs> Cyclops in trouble, says Mark this way. Yes. <laughs> again, trying to give her that sort of a uh, little more severe, um, uh, almost scary look in the eyes. You can notice there's green and there's red-orange in her eyes, so it's like she's in the middle, you know. Mm -hmm. her, the two uh, battling uh, personalities within her. Yeah, no, this is a uh, this is a stunner. I like this one a lot, and I did like you know that was the first thing I noticed was the eyes, you know, the green and uh, with with the uh, red. You know, it, it's just such a you know a thoughtful thing to add to this piece. So yeah, that's great. Um, and congrats to Winter Pal on her pickup. So uh, we got uh, just what well, we got just a couple more pieces here. Let me uh, swing around. So thirty three is still available. Lot 34 is the, the next one. This is uh, Angela. And, uh, you know, like, costume is amazing uh, to draw. I think a lot of artists kind of, you know, enjoy drawing Angela's costume. And uh, this is just sweet. It's on 9 by 12, so it's a little bit smaller. It's a bust again, uh, priced at 450 but just a great image. I mean, you know, edge to edge on the paint, really, really nice. Yeah, this was actually... Um... I had done one as a commission and I ended up doing two of them. Um, and uh, so this one, I, I thought, well, you know, I'll put it in the show. So looks like Steven's grabbing it. Thank you, Steven. Steven Crawford has picked it up. Yes. Thank, thank you so much. Crawford. And I wouldn't have never, I would never have done the character if it hadn't been for that commission. Yeah, I mean, uh, that was uh, a character I wasn't familiar with. I had some uh, some art on the show about six months ago, and I was I had to go do some research because I had never I wasn't familiar with them. But great costume, great piece. Congrats, Stephen, for picking that one up. Uh, I agree with Ryan there. Uh, all of these pieces have been amazing. That's uh, Thank you, that Rich. is Appreciate for sure. Um, all right, two more to go. A lot thirty five is up next. Big Barda on ten by fourteen. And, uh, you know, who doesn't love the uh, Big Barda Kirby costume, right? I mean, this is, uh, you know, the, the focus of this piece for sure. Um, this is on uh, you know, on textured water. Is it watercolor paper, I believe? Uh, yeah, it's watercolor paper. And, I, again, I, I, did, I did a Big Barda for the last show, and I did, like, a pretty involved background, like asteroids floating in space and stuff. And I was really happy with that. But, you know, I really just love this costume so much that I felt like um, – I just wanted to focus on that for this one. And I don't really know what, I mean, you could, I guess I could come up with something to do for the background, obviously, but I just love to, to look at the costume and, and focus on that. Um, she's a great character and she, she, she is coming at you. Look out. She's I actually uh, been rereading the miracle man stuff of late. So I felt like a more of a connection to the character when I was doing this than I have in the past. And um, just such a great character, really kind of under, underappreciated in a way because uh, she you know she predates she hulk and a lot of other uh of strong female characters um in fact she's one of the first ones i mean if you go back to uh even like the marvel stuff that kirby was doing in the 60s 
she's probably the strongest of those too, as far as her force of personality and stuff. All right. Uh, I just wanted to say, uh, Marcelo, thank you so much for participating in the show today and uh, picking up something. Sorry, you got to go, but uh, we are down to the last piece, too. So uh, we appreciate it. And, and again, great design on this one. Yeah, like Wayne said, Kirby's designs are always unbelievable. And yeah, this is uh, just another example of that. Uh, so last piece here. And I know this has a little bit of a story behind it, but this is lot 36 priced at one thousand uh, dollars. Starfish, of course, this is on. Uh, it was actually has I forgot this is the one that actually has a drawing on the back, but I probably should have taken a picture. Oh, uh, that's of that, right. So. There's a drawing in the back. You want to go off? Can you go on camera and? Show oh yeah, that? I can't. Yeah, let me uh, drop this and switch over to me. So it's actually got. Uh, so it's. Too I guess, I guess you, you you didn't like this one enough to paint it, so you decided to go ahead and. Uh, well, yeah, I wanted to just do something that had more uh, movement in it. You know, um, I mean, I could have done that one, and it would it would have been perfectly sure. fun and fine to do. But um, yeah, um, in fact, I'm not even sure if I had forgotten that I had drawn on the back of the piece when I started the other one, it's possible, but I'm pretty sure that I just felt like I wanted to do something that was full figure and had more uh, movement to it. So I'm glad I picked that one. Um, and this piece is from 2018. It actually, uh, I actually um, bought it back and- uh, Right, so you'd sold it and it came became available so you yeah. bought it back yeah and i just thought you know i'll just buy it back and and um it, i'm totally happy with the idea of hanging on to it but at the same time i thought well maybe someone else really wants it so it's a good piece so this all right did you, uh, you i think you mentioned you did a little little touch-ups to it when uh, you got yeah you can't see it on the scans that bill has because i I said I put it, I packed it up and then realized oh I need to rescan it but I, I actually had rescanned it I just couldn't find it but if you if you go Bill if you show the piece you can see where I did metallic uh, acrylic uh, right gloss. yeah let me uh, here and I there some people are I, I I do see people making some claims in the chat too I just want to go ahead and oh okay yeah stand out here but yeah you see if I or if I when I angle it you can see the like the silver and the gold actually yeah. highlights and the colors. Um, on bill, the bill is showing you are not okay. it's a little washed out there there's more there's more vibrant color than what you're seeing in there and yeah and there's it, i went in I, I picked some things out i think i might have picked out one of those one of those uh starfish i think the starfish don't they have something on them too yeah they do too like some there's copper. uh yeah some kind of a coppery so gold on i enhanced it to the degree where i felt it it could the could dagger not going crazy yeah so yeah so that's yeah, it's a very 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 fun piece with those additions to it. So uh, do you do you often buy your uh, artworks back? Uh, I can't really afford to do that as often as I would like, but occasionally I do. Um, and sometimes pieces have come back to me uh, unexpectedly. I did a there's a cover I did for um, I think it's the second cover no it's the third cover to Legends of the World's Finest the three issue miniseries that Walter wrote in there we did in the early 90s and the person who bought the painting is a friend of mine he's a writer in hollywood and i guess i didn't know this but he bought the painting for his son and they framed it and had it on the wall in his room and he went off to college like last year and so they're empty nesters now and i guess they were redoing the room and i didn't know i didn't know too much of this stuff but then he said hey can i get your address and i thought oh maybe he's going to send me a dvd or something he's worked on recently um and um so then this painting came in the mail, this cover that I hadn't seen since the early 90s and I did not have a scan of. It's the, like I said, the third cover, Superman, Batman. Batman's dressed up in these, he's in this kind of gothic uh, dark armor with a sword. And I just, it blew me away. So I, that's on the wall. I got, I framed it and it's on the wall. It's not going anywhere. It's staying here. My kids are going to get it one day. So, but yeah, I, I try, sometimes I try and get stuff back, but not too often. Well, that's uh, that is a beauty, and so uh, that one, this one's gotten claimed by Wayne. Thank you so much, oh, Wayne. Thank you, Wayne. Um, I have uh, been looking at things. I saw Michael claimed lot thirty. That was the nine by twelve poison ivy. So thank you, Michael, oh, for doing that. Good. good. Then I saw, and I highlighted this one already. The creative keep wanted to know if uh, one and twenty-seven were still available, and they are. So I have uh, set those into. Uh, a sold pile those are these two right here the electra and the uh the batman on the rooftop that we talked about right batman rooftop that was a really nice 
one there. So let me see. And I know I saw, uh, let me see, where was it? Uh, da, 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 da. Ron Shepard was uh, wanting lot 12. That was the Halloween girl. So that was uh, the, the more regal one, the taller one. Oh, yeah, yeah. Queen, queen, Hall Halloween, queen girl. Halloween girl, queenly Halloween girl, I should say. And that was uh, this one right here. So thank you very much, Ron. I'm going to mark you, that one down here. Ron Shepard. Awesome pick, pick up there. That one's that one's amazing. It's a Again, big one. A little, little ghost in the uh, in the candy is awesome. Um, all right. So yeah, I, I did get those two or three, I guess uh, that would be. Because um, then we'll have to recap everything. If still available, could you... Uh, Okay, well, it's basically making an offer is what Mike Asbill's making. So he's you're asking us if we could take a thousand dollars for the bride and the tigra. Uh, trying to remember, okay. let, me, let me double check the prices on those because the uh, the bride was at five hundred and uh, the tigra was what? Tigra was um, can't remember now. Uh, where are you? Why can't I not find the tigra piece in my set list here? Da, da, da. There, there she is, 600. Um, uh, sure, well, sure. we weren't going to take offers, Jerry, but there was an offer thrown at her before we yeah. get into it. It's yeah. usually not. I mean, maybe what we should do is recap it and yeah. then we can take offers. How's that? Because, yeah. okay. Mike, we usually don't take, just so you know, we usually don't take offers live. Uh, it's It just makes our life easier. Um, and uh, But we'll go through everything and um, just keep that thought out there, Mike. I mean, you know, again, they're $1,100. They can be yours for $1,100 right now before we get there and, and like you just said, if not, it's okay. Yeah, we typically don't take offers during the show. Um, okay, so I think we've got all the claims that uh, were jumped at uh, before we got to the recap. So we'll just run through the pieces that haven't sold. And of course, I'll be sending out mailings as well about this. Uh, you know, any pieces that are unsold afterwards as well. So you can look for, forward to that. We can go ahead and just look at the auction pieces that didn't sell initially. Uh, first one is that Lavidia that was on 10 by 14. This was uh, auction lot number three. Uh, Wanted to get $1,000 minimum for this one. So uh, this one is out there. And we've got, and uh, Dan, if you don't mind, keep an eye on the chat for me. Because when I'm doing uh, the, the slides, uh, yeah. paper, I yeah. can't see the chat. So okay. if someone okay. has a question or a claim or, or whatnot, please let me know. Now, uh, when I someday do a crossover with Brian Polito with Lady Death and Nocturnals, and this character shows up, you guys are going to feel really silly that you didn't snap this up. Just laying it out there. I'm not saying that's happening. There's no plan. But all I have to do is call Brian and say, hey, Brian, you want to do something? I, I have a feeling Brian's going to be interested. So just, you know, keep those kinds of things in mind. <laughs> yes. Uh, oh, man. All right. So this one's out there at 1,000. Next up uh, that didn't sell. This was, well, it did sell once, Clea. But uh, EC wanted to switch their uh, claim. So yeah. this one is still available at auction uh, lot number four. Thousand dollars. Gotta love those colors. I know, I, I do as well. Uh, then we have lot six still available. That was the Medusa at eleven hundred dollars. Another gorgeous piece, like every other piece that we looked at tonight. Then uh, let's see. Now we get into the fixed price stuff that did not sell. So first up was uh, here we go, Silver Banshee lot number four, price six hundred dollars on eleven by fourteen. We have the uh, Tiger, which we just mentioned. Uh, lot number five, priced at $600 on 11 by 14 as well. And uh, yes, that is her left foot behind her, everybody. So uh, uh, Man Thing was sold to uh, Jerry Bourne. Thank you for that one, Jerry. So we'll take a look at uh, lot seven. That was a Cynthia next. And uh, she's, uh, she's, she's, she's beautiful in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in, in with the tombstones here in the graveyard. But she's, uh, she's at ease there. Um, so seven still available at $700. Then we've got a uh, lot number eight. That was the Eve Warlock priced at $900. The, uh, lot nine lady creeper on, on the larger board, 11 and a half by 16 and a half. This one's at 650. Then, uh, Ron Shepard got a uh, lot 10. So then we have a lot 11. That was, uh, the evening gray, uh, 11 by 14 and priced at $500. Uh, next up, well, both Thrill Killers uh, pieces are still available. Lot 14 at 650 on 11 by 14, and lot 15 at 650 on 11 and a half by 16 and a half. So both of those are out there. And we've got uh, lot 18, the Satana, 
very nice. 11 by 14 on this one, priced at 650. Then uh, let's see, Gabe got lot 19. Then we have lot 20, uh, Lilith, priced at 650 on 11 by 14. Then uh, Rick Welch got the uh, Swamp Thing. So then we have Harley Quinn on 11 by 14, priced at 550. Lot 23, the Lady Bullseye on 11 and a half by 16 and a half, priced at $500. And uh, the Lavidia, again, uh, she's she's beautiful. Maybe even a little bit more beautiful in the graveyard than uh, Cynthia. This one's priced at $600 on 11 by 13 and a half. Then uh, this was the Batman that didn't sell. This one's on 11 by 14, priced at $600, lot 25. Then we have a lot 26, The Bride. Again, this is on 11 by 14, priced at $500. Then uh, lot 27 was the Batman that did sell. Lot 28 is the Black Panther on 11 and a half by 16 and a half, priced at $600, still out there. And lot 29, the Polychrome, all color, edge to edge on 11 by 14, priced at $1,000. Then let's see, uh, 30 did sell. So we have 31, the Vampirella priced at $800 on 11 by 14. Winter Powell picked up lot 32. So then we have lot 33. That was the In Your Face Dark Phoenix. Uh, like Marcus said, probably, you know, uh, Cyclops didn't do the dishes that day. I don't know. Something has riled her. <laughs> so uh, this one's still out there at $800 on 11 by 14. Then uh, last but not least, we have lot 33. 35 the big barda on 10 by 14 priced at one thousand dollars so uh so there's what we've got and uh anybody can uh claim them we will um be sending out a mailing either later today or first thing probably tomorrow morning depends on my schedule yeah, i'll probably get it out later today that uh, goes out to the whole mailing list and highlights any pieces that are unsold anybody who's watching this show after the fact of course can shoot me an email uh bill at comicartfans.com and uh Ask and you know, inquire about any of the pieces that you've seen on here while we were doing the show, and I'll let you know if they're still available. We have, uh, da, 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 I just want to, you know, I can pull the slide up, just makes everything a bit easier. Anybody who claimed anything tonight, or are this, I keep thinking, you know, too used to my night schedule, Dan. Anybody <laughs> claiming anything this afternoon, you know, you got to email me, bill at comicartfans.com. Let me know which artworks you've claimed and uh, include your mailing address, makes things easier, and let me know how you want to pay too. I mean, it saves us some time uh, going back and forth. If you want to pay by PayPal, that's fine. I can invoice you. I will have to add the uh, 4% service fee for people in the US, five and a half international. If you're willing to do Zelle or Venmo, there's no fee at all. And I'm fine with doing those too. So, uh, you know, those are your options. And don't forget, we will add the uh, shipping on as well. 30 uh, domestic, 65 international. There, I think I, I, think I ran through all the, uh, all the finer points of, uh, of all of that. So, you do that well, <laughs> yeah, well, and I don't have a script either. So it's just good that I can uh, remember it from time to time. But, uh, but as always, Dan, this was a lot of fun. I mean, and that's the trick with doing these. We, we could have skipped the whole chat at the beginning and just jumped into the sale and probably, yeah. you know, and we would have gotten done in two hours and we, maybe, and maybe we should think about that. Cause you know, if you do another big set of pieces, uh, I'd, I'd be just as happy to do, to do an hour and a half or two hour interview show with you where we talk about whatever we yeah, want to talk about true. and engage the yeah. audience however they want. Yeah, that's very true. But like I said, it's my fault because when I, when I can do stuff that just, I decide to do, I get, I kind of go a little wild with it. So, um, and, uh, again, you know, there, there weren't a lot of lower price pieces last time. So I wanted to give more people, uh, everybody more of a chance to, to get something and, all right. Well, in Alberto, I guess I missed it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Alberto, I, I probably missed your claim earlier. I, I thought I was catching everything, oh. but I did not see that. Uh, Alberto uh, wanted to claim lots 22 and 28. Oh, so I apologize for missing that. Um, I, I really uh, 22 is uh, let's see. 22 is the Harley Quinn. And oh, okay. Great. Yeah, and 28 is the Black Panther. All right, Alberto. Nice. Well, I, you know, I get excited because when someone else likes something that I liked enough to own it, I feel like I connected, <laughs> you know, so thanks. Oh, yeah. That. Well, it's, you know, because a lot of this stuff, you know, it is it is risky to do pieces in it, you know, that you want. Sure. But like you said, you're doing pieces that you're excited to be doing. So in a way, there's no, you're, there's, you're not losing out either way, whether it sells or it doesn't. Yeah. I mean, this gives you yeah. the to take the other shows. I think shows it's always worthwhile. And um, 
uh, it's not like they're going to sit in my studio forever or anything like that, but, um, it's good to have, I mean, I just appreciate that everyone's coming out to, um, yeah, nice, nice caring. It's yeah, coming out they, to see what I have to, to offer. It's, you know, the artists, we spend a lot of time in the cave and then we come out of the cave and, or we want people to come in, in this case, come into the cave and see what we've been working on. So I really appreciate that, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, here's a question for you, Dan, uh, from black Viper of Dorne. Uh, he, who had to leave for a little bit, uh, you mentioned, you mentioned reworking that lot 36. He says, if I bought lot 33 for a thousand and lot 33 is the, uh, the dark Phoenix, mm -hmm. would, uh, you know, so he, he's saying, you know, because it was priced at 800, he says, would you be interested in putting in another $200, uh, in detail? And I don't know exactly what you may or may not be looking for, but I mean, which it's one is the black, which one is the Phoenix one? The one that doesn't have a that background? One is, uh, let me get that up for you. I, can I think it's the one that, oh, more detail on that one? Uh, if you could explain to me what $200 worth of more detail would be, I can't really, honestly, do you know what I mean? I mean, I could I could keep working on it and noodling it, but I'm not really sure what else. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, you can always noodle things. You can always, you can always go there. Um, but I would be interested in knowing what kind of things, because I was, I thought for a second, they were talking about the Dark Phoenix doesn't have any background. That one I can totally understand putting more, into right. the, back, the phoenix effects or anything like that this one i mean i could do it um i just um we'd have to we would just have to talk well, yes the answer is yes but we'd have to talk about what it is that you're 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 thinking about for me to do so sure right and um because obviously i'd have to ship this back to you dan and what it, what i could do is include the you know like the mace i don't know if you probably pack obviously you pack things really well so you probably don't even need me to send you the piece back with more with some masonite or whatever but i could if you well, wanted there's, there there will be pieces that you're sending back anyway so you could send yeah. it back you know exactly um, and just so you guys know if you do have uh an offer to make um i'm o i'm okay with that you know you just, there's no reason why you can't make an offer you know um so did you want to take that offer that uh that was made earlier the one of oh, the the bride and the tigra for a th yeah sure I'm, I'm okay with that and also um if anyone wants to um do it after the fact just get in touch with bill you know sometimes people come to me afterwards but it's uh you just go ahead and go through bill it makes it easier for all of us because bill right. has all the artwork anyway and then um, anything that's still left over after all that process is over will come back to me eventually. But that's, I don't know when that's going to be. Right. Be and uh, so, uh, so I would say, you know, Black Viper or Adorn, feel free to email me and, you know, we can work out coordinating yeah. with, uh, with Dan on that piece. Uh, so Mike Aspel, we've uh, noted you as getting a uh, lot five and lot 26 at dollars sure. off. And so, uh, so yeah, once, when we send out the mailing, I'll even mention that at the top of the mailing that, uh, you know, if, there's, if you see a piece and you would like to make an offer, it's, we won't be insulted by it. Uh, you know, I'll share it with Dan and if we can work something out, great. I mean, the, the less we have to ship back to Dan, the better, yeah. the more I have to ship from here, you know, out to all of you, the better it is as well. So, um, to add one thing, um, just so you guys know, when I am working on the nocturnal stuff, uh, it is kind of um, under my own scheme. I don't have a page rate that I'm getting paid when I get pages done. It's all about getting the work done and to a point where I feel like, okay, I have a good amount of work finished. Now I can do the Kickstarter. Um, I'm not going to do a Kickstarter for a nocturnal book where I'm going to live off of the money while I'm finishing page pages. I, I have to get a right. certain amount of work done to where I feel good about getting it done in a timely fashion, which means I'm under my own scheme. So these kinds of sales help me do that. They help right. me set aside more time so I can work finishing those pages. In fact, I'm going to show you guys something right now. Um, I have about six pages that are where the art is finished, but I'm going to show you. Whoops. Now these pages aren't done yet, but this is what they. This is what some of them look like right now. When I'm getting ready to start a page, it's very loosely penciled, and then I tape it all down, and then I do these washes. Okay, and you can see there's even Doc Horror standing on a cliff. There's a fox. Um, and so I do about five of these at a time like this, where they're, so you can see them right there. No one's seen these before, by the way. You guys just need to see these and no one else has seen them. So I, I do about five or six pages like this where I do the washes and I kind of set up the colors. You know, they're going to be warm or cool. And then I set them aside to dry. And then I just go back and one after another, I paint them. And I try to get them done as quickly as possible without noodling them too much 
And one of the ways I can do that is, is things like this, like a Kickstarter or, uh, or an art sale. Um, and so it's all, it all, it's, it's all helping me get there basically. Okay. And just a couple other questions for, you know, uh, TJ wanted to know if you'll have uh, any pieces available at Baltimore. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, sure. There's also, but I would say if you, if you have something in mind, uh, for Baltimore, get in touch with Filippo, uh, through Instagram or Facebook, he's comics rep and, um, he's taking my pre-show commissions, which to be honest, that's, that's always the better way to go. Cause I'm doing it. I'm doing a certain number of them in the studio where I have the time and focus to do a, a better piece. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, um, that, and yes, there will be, there will be artwork that's brought to the show for sure. Okay. And, uh, as far as when we do another show, I, I saw someone mentioned, a, they'd love to see a red Sonia. I see a fire lion, uh, lion and Gunwich for next time. So, okay. uh, so, Hey, you know, we're happy taking suggestions for those sorts yeah. of things too. I mean, and, right remember, <laughs> yeah, I mean, Dan, Dan likes to just, you know, go with the things that are, uh, exciting to him, but throwing suggestions at him and then seeing what, uh, you know, happening, you know, you, you never know, he may do it. And, uh, Jerry asks, uh, are you planning doing uh, pre-show commissions for OAX with Dan? I can tell you that we've we've talked about it. Most likely we will. It will be something probably more in the fall. Like, uh, you know, we're uh, late October, November time frame when we would uh, uh, make that announcement. So because Dan tends to work in like, you know, if, if, if he's got the OAX at the end of January, I don't want to talk for you, Dan, but at the end of the day, I know, I know you have like a two or three, you like having, you like being busy two or three months out from a, from either a show with me yeah, or when I you're going to Como. Now it would kind of interrupt my, my flow because I have, I, you know what I mean? There's like slots. So right now after today, I go back to my Patreon rewards mm -hmm. and then my commissions for Baltimore. And then after, and then after those are done and Baltimore is done, then I'll probably have a few more uh, end of the year Patreons, but I'm, what I'm really trying to do is is clear time in my schedule up to three months, if possible. I don't know to finish right. the pages. So that's always my goal. But uh, anytime I'm going to be working on um, something pre-show, it's going to be within a month or two of the, uh, the show. So we'll make that announcement, like Bill said, probably in October, November. If yeah. That, you know, what, yeah. What so we'll talk about it. I mean, we we've already kind of thought about it, but yeah, that, that that's the time frame when we'll be presenting that for OAX. And it'd be um, cool to come on around Halloween, by the way, Bill. I think that would be fun. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. Yeah. And uh, just uh, someone threw out a She-Hulk as a uh, potential option. Oh, uh, T-Pad versus sure. Wonder Woman is always good. Obviously, those sold, in, you know, when we went through the uh, the art the first time. So those are always. Uh, yeah. Of what do you guys think about Sif, Lady Sif? Because um, I was I always liked her, but I, I never no one ever asked me to do her. So I, I don't know if she's popular or not, but, uh, you know strong female warrior character um yeah or uh, a lady thor you know i did that last time and mm -hmm. um that's always a kind of a fun idea so yeah i actually appreciate the comments and the suggestions from people it helps so especially yeah, if we're the same definitely, vibe. definitely always mentioned sif is okay she hawk would be great so that, that's like two thumbs up now for uh for she hawk <laughs> As like Steve Robert said, <laughs> in your tier of, of uh, desires she hulk would be great Right. Well, we did get another red Sonia, you know, and that makes sense. I mean, I, yeah, I think yeah. you would paint a pretty badass uh, red Sonia image. Well, I can you know, only... I did, did I do one last time for the show? <sighs> did, done I, don't, I don't think so. I, had I don't a, think you had I one in the first show. I had one I did for Como that was really happy with it, had a real Frank Thorne vibe to it. And um, no, I'm surprised that I haven't actually um, done, didn't do one this time, but I, I'll definitely do one next time. Yeah. Next year. Yeah uh wayne says sif and valkyrie so uh, yeah oh yeah valkyrie's yeah, another but, one yeah another really good character yeah, yeah. evil lynn <laughs> yes actually i get asked to do her i did one for my patron my one of my patrons um it's all uh ink and wash uh sitting on like a throne with her thing yeah so i like that character too in fact did i do no i did one for como but i didn't do one for uh for the last show all right and stephen crawford who picked up the uh the Angela piece mentioned Zealot as a, another option. Oh, someone asked me about that one recently, and I, I haven't done it, but yeah, that would that would be interesting to do. Zealot's a, a wild. I never did the. Uh, I did some uh, Wild Storm gallery cards in the early '90s, but I never did Zealot. Okay. Just, just, yeah. 
Yeah, uh, Charles said Snoopy, and then T. Ted said <laughs> Snoopy, Snoopy, but spooky. <laughs> no, I, when I was a huge fan of uh, Charles. I mean, I still am a fan of Charles Schultz, but when I was like following and cutting the strips out and putting them in a photo, a photo album like every day uh, when I was 12, I would try and draw the characters, and my Snoopy never – there's only one person who can draw Snoopy, and it looks like Snoopy, and that's Charles Schultz. But I actually came up with all these other characters. I was drawing these like reptile lizards and snakes and possums and stuff that I was doing for a strip I wanted to do back then. But one thing I did catch from the way that he would draw Snoopy when Snoopy was happy is this thing here, which I'll show you, which is the double sixes. Can you see that? Uh, move it to your right. Go to oh, other, other right. Sorry. The other right. Yeah. I think you're mirrored. See? A little further. A little further. A little further. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> yes. He's happy, these little double sixes. That is very true when he's happy. Oh, exactly. <laughs> And I started using that in my cartoon characters and I was doing it a lot, like, like really overdo it. It became like this thing. And uh, what's funny about it is if you look at my, my, um, this is not planned, but if you look at my, uh, my signature, mm -hmm. similar. <laughs> anyway, okay. everyone's officially out. They're like, <sighs> So. No, they're not. There's still 91 people watching. They're they're interested. <laughs> Ryan Peters mentioned uh, Thanos as a as, oh, as an option. That would be. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm definitely going to write that down because uh, I've been thinking about doing Thanos. Um, and uh, to be honest, I got this thought in mind for OAX if I was going to do some spec pieces for it to bring to the show of maybe doing a couple of uh, multi figure things like. Uh, three three figures on a on a piece and let me show you something um this is the piece i started and i never finished several years ago i don't know if you can see it's superman wonder woman and batman and uh something like i might i think i'm going to finish this piece and i'll have it with me someplace maybe i don't know if it's in baltimore or oax or whatever but i was thinking about doing like a zamora thanos and uh adam warlock from mm -hmm. the star era you know, like yeah. together in a piece and maybe some other like uh, trio pieces. It takes longer to do those because you have to like, you know, you have to compose these figures together and stuff. But I think it would be really cool to see some uh, some um, uh, group shots. It's just, there's much of, just more of an outlay of time, like Thor with Hela. That would be really cool. You know, I've never done that before. So we'll see. We'll see what I can have time to do. Like I said, I'm still trying to finish a Nocturnal's graphic novel, so. Exactly. And uh, just a few other suggestions. I mean, I'm not familiar with this one. Frank said uh, Iron Maiden from Wally Woods Thunder Agents. Oh, that's interesting. I'll have to look that up. Yeah. Uh, and then we had a Power Girl. She presents well, says T-Tad. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then there was a Lady Death. And uh, you also had a, a Galactus and or Eternity. Eternity sorry. And then oh, Mike, those are interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And then Mike uh, seconded on the Power Girl. So that would be a good one. Um, you, want to, you want to try and do something that more than two people are going to be interested in because the last time I took one of the suggestions I took for the last time was a man thing piece and I did the man thing piece and it didn't sell to the person who had asked for it which is fine you know but it did sell so as long right. as there's two people who are interested and say yeah I second that then I feel like I'm safe in doing it if it's not something I'm like passionate about to begin with like Iron Maiden I'm not, I have to look up Iron Maiden mm -hmm. that sounds pretty interesting uh, and Alberto mentioned some Star Wars characters like Ashoka might, might be good. Uh, yeah, that's a that's an interesting one. Um, I tend to not do them by choice so much, but uh, yeah, she's a great character, so I, that could be fun to do for sure. <laughs> uh, then, really then Mike mentioned it. Venom oh. and Carnage, uh, Zatanna, okay. Mystique, the Invaders. Boy, there's a, the Crow. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of a lot of the stuff just fits uh, really well. I mean, when you name it, like when, when you say time. Mystique, I can think uh, you would paint a really great Mystique. And same thing. Well, with, I did um, one last time, remember? Yes, uh, we, that's we right. I forgot you. You are. You are yeah. yeah, and uh, we had Satana this time, but you know, I might do her again. Um, I think we've got more than enough thought ideas for the next yeah. show or OAX or Baltimore or anything. It's about like Captain America or like Bill suggested Spider Man. Um, yeah, well, I get to Alberto's in the audience, and Alberto's a big Captain America fan, so uh, you know it, he uh, would we'd be very interested in a cat piece, that's for sure. And I know your love for Kirby. I, I can only imagine your approach to uh, 
to cap with like I, I don't know I, I can't I, I just know it would be very uh, very dynamic well I think if I if I do when I do Captain America it's I'm my touchstones are definitely Kirby and Bissema so it could go one way or the other both are mm -hmm. somewhere sure. in the yeah so I've, I've done Captain America a few times I actually did one for Mitch Mitch Halleck uh, the terrific on he commissioned he wanted me to do a bust Captain America bust and he was uh, commissioning it and I thought, well, you know, he's had me out to the show twice and he's a, he's a good guy. So I just did a torso piece mm -hmm. for him and said, here, it's for you. And so um, I don't think I'm the first person to give that guy a piece of artwork for nothing. But uh, I just felt weird. It's uh, Sometimes it's weird when people commission you to do stuff and it feels weird to charge them when you feel like right. you, you know. That's why, I like, when I did the Thor, I knew that there was a chance you'd be interested in it. And I just always make you feel weird about it. It's like, you know, it's like, you know. How do you, it's the etiquette is interesting. I'm sure there are people out there that have a oh Morbius, yeah, for sure. Thanks, Wayne. There's people who have an idea of what what to do about that is, which is to maybe just be a businessman or or not. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, Sometimes straddle the line. Uh, somebody mentioned. Oh, Brett Mac mentioned Red uh, Monica. All right. Well, we got. I think we have a long list of yeah. potential characters. I don't, know, I, never, I don't know who Red Monica is though. Who's Red uh, Monica? Uh, you, you, you might yeah, her costume's kind of cool. I think you might. Uh, I'll look her. I'll and look then, her. Uh, yeah, then another vote for Red Sony. Red Sony would definitely be a good one. Yeah, yeah. There might um, be more than one Red Sony next time, guys. So, uh, so I know we're going to be doing this uh, Patreon chat. You want to? Do you want to just do it in like uh, starting like five, seven minutes to give uh, us both a, a break? What, some... what time? How? So, how far over did we go? We went on almost an, an hour over, right? Yes, we did. Uh, yes, yeah. We did. So, my Patreon chat starts in uh, less than ten minutes. So, right. um, so, so I'll be hanging out to start. Yeah. I've got, uh, I'm going to, I've got a lot of emails to go through. I've been seeing a lot of people emailing me. So thank okay. you everybody for doing okay. uh, what we always ask. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, indeed. So, uh, so Dan and I will definitely do this again, uh, you know, probably after OAX, but we will have Dan on sometime in the fall where we'll talk about uh, OAX and probably set up some kind of a pre-con list with everybody. So look forward to that. And if you're going to Baltimore, of course, look Dan up and then any other major shows, throughout the rest of the year for you, Dan, that people can uh, see you? Uh, yeah, so Baltimore and then Dallas in, I want to say October. Oh, that's uh, what you mentioned, Dallas with uh, yeah, Mark Walters. Uh, yep. San Francisco in uh, late November, and I think that's it for now. But, uh, yeah. All right. Those, so that's enough. Yeah. Maybe that's enough. I don't know. It is. Got, yeah, a lot of absolutely. To do at home, so. <laughs> I was going to do a show in uh, Burbank this month, a Japan World Heroes show. It was a freaking three day show. And I had to cancel on that because of work. And then uh, same thing with uh, San Jose. So um, I love doing shows. I love saying yes. Uh, but sometimes the, the work at home just keeps you here. So it happens all the time. Oh, yeah. Uh, our, it's great yeah. to see you. Well, yeah. you know what I mean? To see you. Exactly. Well, it, you know, it'd be fun to actually see you in person in January. But I, but, but I want to thank everybody for hanging out with us today. You know, it's a Saturday afternoon. We know you got lots of other things yeah. you can do. It's still summer. School's starting if you got kids. Uh, but we appreciate you taking the time to hang out with us today. Uh, don't forget to email me if you claimed any artworks, Bill at ComicArtFans.com, and we'll take care of uh, the invoicing and everything. But uh, Dan and I sincerely appreciate your support. And we, we enjoy getting to hang out and talk with you guys yeah. as much as I think you guys Definitely. like watching them and hanging out and interacting too. So and your comments to Bill are always appreciated. You know, your afterwards, how your thoughts about things or whatever is always appreciated to hear what you guys think. So, and thank you for everyone who made a claim. Thank you from uh, the bottom of my heart. So it really makes it, makes it a difference. And you know, the thing is, is it's you, a person could easily just hang back and not do anything and then wait till later. But the fact that you guys, step forward means a lot to both of us and it's what help, keeps us going indeed indeed all right everybody enjoy the rest of your afternoon for those of you who are on the patreon we'll be uh, we'll see you in the next 10 minutes and uh thanks again enjoy the rest of your weekend take care bye guys <laughs>